You are listening to Not Your Average Joe by Brooke St. James. Read for you by Kate Rudd. Chapter One The lady just passed with drinks and peanuts, Emily whispered from the seat next to me. I peered at her through my barely open lids and watched sleepily as she ate a few peanuts from her hand, facing me again with a smile as she chewed. I thought about getting you something, but I didn't know what you wanted. It's fine, I said. I straightened up as I took in my surroundings, remembering I was on an airplane on my way to Ireland to attend my best friend's spur-of-the-moment wedding. One glance to my right revealed Drake, who was out cold with his head against the closed window shade. Drake was a good friend of ours, but he was also coming along as the paid photographer, a job at which he was very gifted. It was my first time meeting Emily, but she was a childhood friend of Sarah's, and I had found it easy to sit next to her and make conversation during our flight. Emily grew up in New York, but was currently living in Georgia where she had a career in finance. She flew from Atlanta to JFK, where she met the rest of us, and we boarded this flight headed to Dublin. It was all for Sarah, who had gone to Ireland on vacation with her boyfriend, Colin, and decided to get married while they were there. So, there I was, on an impromptu trip to Ireland to watch my friend tie the knot. Sarah's relationship with Colin had developed so quickly that this whole situation seemed a little dreamlike. One minute, I'm home, and the next, I'm on a plane over the ocean, headed to Ireland. It all felt a little surreal. I was distracted and distant, which was nothing new because I currently had a lot of personal stuff going on. I was at a point in my life when lots of changes were about to take place, and quite frankly, I was terrified of all of them, hence the reason I was melancholy. But the feelings I had been dealing with in recent days and weeks had nothing to do with the bride-to-be or her newfound happiness. I loved Sarah and was truly happy that she had found Colin. Emily, however, was the exact opposite of melancholy. Emily oozed happiness. She smiled even when nobody was looking at her. She seemed relieved that I had woken up so that she finally had someone to talk to, but I was still groggy from my nap and wasn't quite ready to make conversation. I returned her smile with a sleepy one of my own before grabbing a magazine out of the seat back pocket in front of me. I can't believe Joe's still single, Emily whispered after only a few seconds of silence. I glanced up just after Sarah's brother, Joe, passed us, headed up the aisle toward his seat. I was hit by a waft of air he left in his wake that smelled like glorious, clean masculinity. There was no mistaking it was Joe. I had a crush on him since the very moment I laid eyes on him. Look at him. Who wouldn't? I used to have the biggest crush on him when we were younger, Emily whispered, confirming my thoughts and causing me to let out a humorless laugh. I almost told her that I had a super bad crush on him for the last four years, which was the truth. But Emily had just stated her own feelings for him, and we all know it's girl code not to crush on the same guy, especially since she technically knew him first. I figured when it came down to it, none of it really mattered anyway, since neither of us would ever have a shot at Joe. Emily and I were both decent-looking human beings. Both of us put a little effort into our appearance and brushed our teeth and everything, but Joe dated a different sort of women. Joe dated the likes of models. He had the face of an angel, and his father was one of the most successful television producers of all time, so there was never a shortage of beautiful actresses interested in getting to know Joe. To top it off, he had the charm to handle and deserve their attention. He was a man's man, with the smoothness and confidence of a crooner. He had such charisma that I could imagine him grabbing a partner and randomly doing a highly choreographed dance in the middle of normal life just because he was happy and felt like it. Honestly, it was more like I had imagined him doing that with me. Either way, he could get away with that type of thing. He was cool enough. Everyone loved Joe. I stared at his smiling profile as he leaned against the overhead bins, waiting for whoever was in the seat to get adjusted. His smile even from the side, was devastatingly handsome, and I wished I was the person sitting in that seat so I could see it more closely. 
He was always so sweet, Emily said. I glanced at her to find that she was staring at Joe shamelessly, same as I had been. Even if he broke my heart when I was in the eighth grade. My gut clinched at the fact that she was stating her feelings toward Joe. I had no right to be jealous, but I was. I didn't say anything, though. I just smiled at her and nodded, hoping she wouldn't say anything else. He was sweet about it, but he totally broke my heart. It took me a year, but I worked up the nerve to tell him how I felt. She paused and smiled, shaking her head as she remembered something. He smiled at me and said he wasn't allowed to date, she said, cringing a little. He was trying to be nice, and I respect that, but I was heartbroken. I had my heart set on riding off into the sunset with him, you know? Doesn't every girl, I said after a brief pause. Emily glanced at me as if considering for the first time that I might have a crush on Joe myself. We used to call him Jojo, she said. Everyone called him that for the longest. He didn't switch over to Joe until he made it with that app, and that was when he was a senior in high school, she giggled. Everyone just sort of started calling him Joe once he made a million bucks. I smiled and watched absentmindedly as Joe got settled into his seat, which was about five or six rows ahead of us. His family still calls him Jojo sometimes, I said. I heard his mom call him that recently. Did you know that app was his last-ditch effort to get out of going to medical school? I think so, I said. I heard something about Mr. Spicer wanting him to go to medical school. I knew a little more than I was letting on, but I was curious to see what Emily was talking about. She glanced in front of us just to make sure we weren't being overheard. Mr. Saul was so obsessed with it, she said. He got the boys medical equipment and science stuff for Christmas and birthdays when we were kids. They had this professional microscope that could probably cure cancer or something. Sarah mostly got out of it since she was a girl, but he was dead set on those boys being doctors. I knew he liked the medical field, I said. That's what made him think of bad medicine. Bad Medicine was Saul Spicer's biggest television hit. The nighttime drama had been going strong for over ten seasons and was a monumental success. Mr. Saul loves doctors, Emily confirmed, nodding. He said he wanted to be one himself, but he wasn't smart enough. Not in a scientific way, at least. He had this friend growing up whose dad was a doctor. Apparently, he really loved that family. It made quite the impression on him. I think once he even watched the dad give CPR to someone and save their life. Anyway, he really tried to steer his boys in that direction. Obviously, Eli listened, I said, since Sarah's oldest brother, Eli, was a pediatrician. Eli was already on the straight and narrow to medical school when Joe went into his senior year of high school. The plan was for them to open a practice together, and Mr. Spicer couldn't have been more thrilled. Joe felt trapped. He figured the only way he could avoid medical school was to make a success of himself some other way, so that's what he did. I already knew all about Joe's app. It was a widely used app where you could rate and locate medical professionals in your area. He created it eight years ago, which put him at the forefront of apps like that, and it was a complete success. It still is to this day. Millions of people use it, and they've now branched into pharmacy services. MedWeb was a staple in the first few basic apps people download when they got a phone. In fact, it may have even come pre-installed on mine. Mr. Saul didn't push for medical school once Joe started making real money, Emily said, pulling me from my thoughts. She chuckled and shook her head in amazement. Basically, Joe's genius idea was hatched from sheer desperation of not wanting to go to medical school. I don't even think he has a fondness for medicine she added. I think he just made the app what it is for his dad's sake. To get him off of his back about becoming a doctor? I asked. She shrugged and nodded. Probably. Starting MedWeb is a pretty crazy thing to do just to get someone off your back, I said. I stared at the magazine in my lap with a sigh, as if to signal the end of our conversation. I smiled, but it was fairly forced. I was already feeling a little downhearted, and I didn't really want to hear about how wonderful this girl thought Joe was. She may not have said those words, that she thought he was wonderful, but she thought it, I could tell. He was wonderful. So I chose to look at it as if she and I were just agreeing on it. I can't believe he didn't bring a date, 
she said. She glanced at me, and I just gave her a little smile, but she continued to stare at me like she expected me to comment. It was a quickly planned trip, I said, stating the obvious. Is he dating anyone? she asked. He never posts anything on social media. I don't know, I said, even though I was relatively sure Joe was almost always dating someone. I'm not trying to get into a relationship right away, she said. She had already told me about her recent breakup, so I knew why she was saying that. I smiled. That's a good idea, I said, being cordial even though I was in a quiet mood. I'd totally scrap that idea if Joe asked me out, though, she said. She said it in a sweet, longing way that honestly made me want to do something crazy like stomp my foot onto hers to make her stop looking at him and talking about him. As an artist, I was a lover, not a fighter, so I refrained from such drastic measures. I'd scrap whatever I was doing to hang out with Joe, too, I said, my voice coming out a little shaky. It wasn't that big of a deal, but I still sort of felt like I was confronting her a little, so my face started to blush. I was thankful when Drake began to stir, giving me an excuse to turn the other way and discontinue the conversation. Chapter 2 Sarah's parents knew a lot of rich, powerful people, and they happened to have a friend in Ireland who owned an estate the likes of which I had never seen. It was the place where the wedding would be held, and many of the guests were staying there. I had been friends with Sarah for a long time and had been to some pretty fancy places with her, but none of them compared to this. Dublin was beautiful to begin with, but the Steiner's home which everyone referred to as the Banks Estate, was one of the most breathtaking places I had ever seen. It was so grand and immaculate that I had a hard time believing that I was at a private residence. The estate had 14 bedrooms, and the Steiners were hosting nearly all of the wedding guests who had flown in from the U.S. It was a quickly planned trip, so when Sarah's parents purchased the tickets, they made them all the same without asking anyone's opinions about travel dates or times. Had I been the one to choose, I would have made my stay a little longer and done some cheap or free sightseeing, staying in hostels or backpacking for an extra night or two. But hey, it was a trip to Ireland that I wasn't paying for, so I'd have to take what I could get. As it stood, we were staying two nights, the evening before the wedding and the evening of the wedding. Everything leading up to the wedding seemed to happen in a blur, and before I knew it, the all-too-short stay in Ireland was more than halfway over. Mrs. Steiner had planned the wedding, which was an afternoon-long affair, followed by a formal dinner. It was almost time for that dinner to begin when I did something extremely regrettable. I'll just go ahead and say it. Out of sheer spite, I kissed one man when I really wanted to kiss another. I did it, and it was over. There was nothing I could do to take it back. Of course, there were worse things I could do, but that didn't change the fact that I felt uncomfortable and full of regret afterward. Let me back up a little and explain a few things that led up to this. First off, the Steiner's home was so beautiful that it was almost magical. It seemed like not having some romantic encounter while I was there would be a total waste of such a wonderful atmosphere. I told myself I just had to have a romantic encounter, or Ireland was a complete bust. Okay, let's face it, I only told myself that because I wanted to have one. And I only wanted to have one because Joe was on the trip. The last 24 hours had only caused me to become more keenly aware of his presence, his charm. I wished I was the one by his side during all the festivities. Instead, I was trying not to get caught stealing glances at him. As the afternoon of the wedding celebration passed, I got more and more ashamed of myself for wasting my time pining over the only man I couldn't have. I had already been dealing with other feelings before I ever came on this trip. Emotions that were tied into life choices. Stuff about feeling selfish for studying art when I could have chosen something more lucrative. I felt like my decision to be an artist might have been one big mistake. I needed something where I could make some real money and maybe even be able to help my parents eventually, or pay them back for all they sacrificed for me to go to college. 
If someone else would look at my life from the outside, they'd probably think I had it all together. I was a fairly recent graduate with a degree in fine art from Columbia. I had recently been selected for a coveted spot at the Shower and Shelter Artist Collective, where for the next two years I would enjoy free rent while being surrounded by 30 of New York's finest up-and-coming artists. On top of being selected to live at SNS, I had more exciting news. My spot would become available in four months' time, which happened to be August, and since August was the month that producers were coming in to do a six-part Netflix documentary on the place, I happened to be the new kid at the exact right time. So, not only was I selected to live rent-free at New York's most coveted artist community, it was looking like I was, by default, going to be one of the few artists showcased in a documentary. From the outside, it might seem like I had direction, or was making real progress as an artist, but that's not what I felt like on the inside. Lately, I had been unsure of my abilities and questioned if I even deserved the spot in the house, let alone the documentary. I tried to act like I was excited about everything, because I knew that's how it should be, but I was nervous, brutally nervous, crippled with nerves. I mean, really? What if they gave me the spot in the house and on the series, and all of a sudden, I couldn't create art anymore? What if I just forgot how to draw one day? What if I did my best and I didn't live up to their standards? It didn't help matters that I wasn't really making any money yet, which was obvious by the fact that I even needed to apply for free housing in the first place. My parents weren't rich. They scraped by to pay for my college, and I definitely had some guilt for choosing to study art instead of something that could have guaranteed more income. All of these insecurities and doubts, however, were carefully kept on the inside. As far as everyone was concerned, I was happy with my path and excited to be moving forward at SNS. And really, all things considered, I was. I was intelligent enough to know that my life was in a good place in spite of the uncontrollable, hopeless feelings that nagged at me, insisting the opposite. I had two choices. I could let all these doubts and feelings and frustrations make me quit doing art, or I could keep going. And since I didn't plan on quitting, I had no other choice but to fake it till I made it. For the most part, it wasn't that difficult for me to smile and act confident and happy even when I didn't feel like it. So that's what I did. I assume I had great acting skills because no one ever knew the difference. So there I was with all these personal feelings swirling around, about to set the stage for my big mistake. It was a romantic afternoon in a perfect house with music and friends and laughter. Joe was more perfect than ever, and it was him I was ultimately attracted to. That was why I was so ashamed of myself for what ultimately happened. I had shared a passionate kiss in some storage room at the Steiner's home with a man who was not Joe Spicer at all. His name was Grant. He was one of the wedding guests Sarah and Colin had met while they were in Ireland. He was handsome and sweet, and his accent was obviously an added bonus. Our surroundings were incredibly charming, and I truly thought it was a perfectly rational decision of me to share a kiss with him. I was really hoping it would make me forget about Joe, but it didn't, and I knew that right after we kissed. The worst part was that Grant was really nice. He smiled and told me I was beautiful, which made me feel even worse about the whole thing. I breathlessly and regretfully told him he should leave ahead of me so that we didn't get caught. I said dinner was about to get started since that was the truth. He left, and I waited in the storage room for about two minutes before opening the door. No one had been around when we went in there, and I didn't hear anything, so I assumed I'd open the door to an empty hallway. I was wrong. Sarah was walking directly toward me, and she smiled at me when I caught her eye. Hey, she said. Her face changed as she began to curiously take in my surroundings. What's in there? she asked, peering around me even though she was still a few feet from me. I stepped into the hallway, closing the closet door behind me. I took a wrong turn, I said, trying not to seem nervous. It's really been a beautiful day, I said. Everything was picture perfect. My heart was pounding, and I felt sick to my stomach at my own situation. But I had to shift the attention back to Sarah and her wedding, since that was way more important than my drama. 
I was just trying to find my way back to the party, I said. I was planning on walking off, but I felt her finger come up and touch my chin, right near my lower lip. I pulled back and looked at Sarah, who was staring at me with a patient, extremely curious expression that made me feel restless and defensive. I stepped to the side, making what I hoped was a calm, happy face. You have lipstick right there, she said, staring at me like a skeptical best friend who knew I'd been kissed. My heart raced as I reached up to touch my chin. I barely even had any lipstick on, and I... I know, but there's some glitter down there, she said. I could see it in the light, and I can just tell. I let out a little laugh. I felt frustrated and ashamed like I had definitely made the wrong choice by kissing Grant. Who was it? she asked, looking happy for me and excited to hear the scoop. I stared down shyly and shook my head. Who was what? I asked, pretending not to know what she was talking about. Who was it that made you get lipstick all the way down there? She asked sweetly. She smiled at me before her face shifted to one of slight concern. I could tell she thought it was odd that I didn't want to talk to her about it, but I just couldn't let myself tell her what happened. I knew it wasn't a big deal for me to kiss a guy, but I was still embarrassed about how it went down with Grant and all the feelings for her brother that were wrapped up with it. I can't believe you're not going to tell me, she said when I remained silent. She tried to seem playful, but I knew she wanted me to say more. I seriously don't know what you're talking about, I said. Sarah, the beautiful bride, folded her arms across her chest and squinted at me. You got kissed, Lou. I smiled and shook my head innocently. What? I asked. I have no idea what you're talking about. I pulled a small mirror out of the clutch I had strapped to my wrist and checked my face, which was not nearly as out of order as I thought it would be. I made a quick swipe across my lower lip area, before stashing the mirror in my bag with a smile aimed at Sarah. Let's go to dinner, I said as I roped my arm in hers. I'm starving. Chapter 3 From the perspective of a girl who had just regretfully kissed one man out of the desire for another man, the wedding dinner was so awkward it was comical. Our seating arrangements had been carefully mapped out before we ever got there and Mrs. Steiner had no way of knowing the predicament I would have gotten myself into, but she positioned me painfully close to both Joe and Grant. Grant was sitting next to the guy who was sitting at my right, and since he was comfortable with that person, he asked if they could trade places. This put him directly next to me. He kept leaning over to speak to me. Joe, on the other hand, was sitting directly across from us. It was one of those giant tables you'd imagine in a medieval castle, so even though Joe was right across from me, he was still about five feet away. The people sitting at my side, Grant on my right and Emily on my left, were definitely closer, so they made conversation with me the whole time. It would have been weird for me to ignore them in favor of trying to talk to Joe from across the table, especially when he was engaged in conversation with his family who were sitting on that side. Dinner was served in courses, and seemed to take forever. Everyone was having a great time, though, and I found it easy to keep a smile on my face in spite of my own feelings and nerves. Several times during dinner, I made eye contact with Joe, and each time, my heart either sped up or stopped beating completely. I couldn't tell. All I knew was that my chest felt funny every time our eyes met. I could steal glances of him any time and manage not to be so affected. But the second he looked back at me and our eyes met, I felt a gut-clenching, chest-aching sensation that took my breath away. His hair was longer, and it was combed away from his face. I scanned the edges of his face, studying it with an artist's eye. The lines and proportion and symmetry were all so perfect that I couldn't help but get lost staring at it. His face was literally the most pleasing thing I had ever seen. He was what I'd draw if I tried to give a face to perfection. His eyes, which were some shade of greenish hazel, were light at the center and dark around the edges. Even from all the way across the table and with low lighting, I could see the striking pattern. More than a few times, he and I looked straight at each other. 
and each time it happened, I could only hold eye contact for a second or two before glancing away. I always broke it before he did. It was like my eyes could only handle a certain level of exposure. He was too gorgeous. He was masculine, yet well-groomed, and he carried himself with all the confidence of a man who went to the best schools and grew up surrounded by New York's elite, which he did. His confidence became all too apparent when he and his brother gave an unforgettable speech. Several people gave speeches during the dinner, but none compared to Eli and Joe's. Eli started the speech by clanging his fork to a glass to get everyone's attention. He spoke for a minute before Joe interjected with a hilarious comment, which led to him telling a story about Sarah when she was a kid. He and Eli went back and forth in an exchange that was hilarious and heartwarming. It was so entertaining that people accused them of rehearsing the whole thing, which they 100% denied. If I wasn't before, I was helplessly enchanted with Joe Spicer by the end of that speech. It was one thing to make a study of his appearance from an artist's perspective, but it was another thing altogether to see him in action, the way his eyes squinted and his cheeks creased when he smiled. Breathtaking. I felt jealous of any girl who had ever been close to Joe. I felt ashamed that I kissed a guy without even liking him. I felt nervous at the proximity of both of the guys, and on top of that, I had my own emotions in the mix. It was bad timing on my part to be dealing with insecurities during all of this, but insecurities are not the easiest creatures to shake. I smiled and acted natural, but I was on autopilot and had, to some extent, checked out mentally. I tried to ignore my feelings altogether, which meant I succumbed to a certain numbness. It was near the end of dessert when Sarah and Colin left, headed for their honeymoon in a nearby castle. It happened quickly. One minute, we were sitting around the table, finishing dessert, and the next, we were rushing outside with confetti to throw at them as they were leaving. Drake, ever the master at setting up picture-perfect moments, had sparkling confetti with little streamers that hung in the air when you threw it. He demonstrated how it worked with a handful of it, right before Sarah and Colin came out, so we'd know what to expect. There was a grand farewell, and the next thing I knew... We were all just standing there looking at the back of their car. An arm came around my shoulder, and I glanced to my right to find Grant. His grip around me was feather light, so I easily stepped to the side, playing it off like I hadn't even noticed it was there. It's your last night here, he said with a huge grin. You've got to let me take you to a pub. Joe was standing close enough to hear us, a fact which made me feel nauseated. I think I'll stay here. I said, looking tired and regretful. Thank you, though. I'm glad you got to come to the wedding. Are you sure? He said. We know the best places in town. We could give you the insider's tour. You're so sweet for asking, but I'm afraid I'm too tired, I said. I would never in my normal life use the phrase, I'm afraid, but I was nervous, and that made me say things I wouldn't normally say. I'm not too tired, Joe said. He came to stand near Grant and me, stretching and popping his knuckles like he was ready for action. And, simply because he had a magnetic personality, a few others joined the group. Suddenly, Grant had several willing American tourists. Emily, along with Eli and his wife, Rebecca, came over, all looking interested in whatever Joe was getting into. Perfect, Grant said, looking around at all of them. We'll get a whole crew together and go get into some trouble. He glanced at me with raised eyebrows. You want to change your mind? I'd like to change my clothes, Emily interjected. This drew agreements from Joe, Rebecca, and Eli. Joe nudged his chin at Grant. If you give me the address of the place, we can just get a group together and meet you there. Yeah, and maybe we can talk Lou into coming by the time we leave, Emily said with an arm around my shoulder. I smiled, even though I hated myself for wanting to change my mind now that I knew Joe would be there. We'll see, I said, shrugging. Everyone began to make their way back inside with talk of resting and cleaning up for an hour or so before heading into the city. Grant, along with the other Ireland guests, left after Sarah and Colin drove away. We said goodbye to them before we went in, and Joe promised Grant and the others he would see them later with whoever wanted to go to the pub. We had just stepped inside 
when Mr. Steiner came up beside me, putting a hand on the back of my arm. My wife asked me to show you to your new room, he said. She had to have Madeline move your things so we could use that room for someone else. I think one of the gentlemen from the London crew has trouble with stairs. I nodded and smiled at him. Yes, sir, she told me I'd be switching rooms tonight. I wasn't sure if she'd already moved my things. Well, as far as I understand, she has. And I happen to know the location of your new room. He stuck his arm out for me. I'd be delighted to show you to it. We're going to be leaving in an hour, Joe announced, walking backward across the entryway. He pointed at the floor. Anyone who's coming, meet us back here. Everyone dispersed, and I walked with Mr. Steiner up some stairs and down a wide hallway. Saul and Rhonda are right over there, he said, gesturing to a door further down the hall as we stopped in front of what I assumed was my new room. He opened the door and stepped inside, inviting me to follow him. This is so nice, I said. I glanced at him, and we shared a little smile. He wasn't short or anything, but for whatever reason, he reminded me of a hobbit. Maybe it was the bulbous nose. Anyway, he came across as sweet and quietly cheerful. I felt comfortable in his presence, which was why I instinctually let out a sigh and let my shoulders slump. Busy day, he said, reaching out to run his hand up and down the top part of my arm in a comforting way. Yes, sir, I said. I knew my voice came out sounding puny, and there was nothing I could do about it. I felt sad, and I had been faking it so much all day that it was simply impossible to continue the act anymore. Are you all right, sweetheart? He asked, sounding every bit like a dad. I wanted to cry. I tried to glance into the empty space next to us to distract myself, but Mr. Steiner leaned to the side, putting himself into my line of vision. Can I do something for you? He asked. I stood there for a few seconds like a deer in the headlights, because I knew if I talked, my voice would come out too high or shaky, or both. I cleared my throat. No, sir, I said. I'm fine. You don't seem fine, he said. I shook my head, feeling disappointed with myself for not being able to keep it together. I knew tears were welling in my eyes as he stared at me. I'm super happy for Sarah and Colin. I don't want you to think it's that. I love being here and everything. I, I hesitated. I, uh, think I'm just managing to have a terrible day on a great day, if that's even possible. It really was a great day. He smiled at me before pulling me closer to him in a comforting, fatherly way. I hugged him, and it didn't feel forced or uncomfortable at all. In fact, I needed the contact. I was thankful for the excuse to stare downward, and I rested my forehead on his shoulder. Unfortunately, sweetheart, it's extremely easy to have a terrible day in the midst of a perfect one. It happens to people all the time. I'm super happy for Sarah, I said. Me too, he said. They're a good young couple. I've got my own stuff going on. Like what? he asked. I meant to refrain from elaborating, but Mr. Steiner seemed sincere and in no hurry to get back to what he was doing. I must have needed to vent or just wanted his advice because I proceeded to tell him everything. Chapter 4 I make this art, I said. I remember, Mr. Steiner said kindly. I saw pictures of it last night. I smiled. I didn't know if you'd remember, since there are so many of us. Of course I do, Lou, he said. He used a hand on my back to lead me to the center of the room, where there was a small seating area with a couch. He took a seat on it. The long-bodied figures in black, he asked, trying to remember what my art looked like. He had done a good job of describing my style, and I smiled and nodded as I sat next to him. He sat back and looked at me like he had all the time in the world. I quite liked what I saw of your work, he said. I tried to manage a smile, but it was hard since I'd been doing it all day. Thank you, I said. I really have no reason to be upset. I said with a sigh. What's going on with your art? He asked, since that's where I started. It's great, I said. I'm working at a coffee shop part-time, but I'm starting to get more commissions, mostly through social media. I'll be staying at that shower and shelter place I was telling everyone about, so I'll have free rent for the next couple of years. 
Hopefully it'll work out where I can quit the coffee shop and focus on my art full time. I remember you saying that, he said. Isn't that exciting news? It would be if I knew what I was doing, I said, letting the hopelessness I'd been feeling show on my face. I barely even knew this man, and I already felt indebted to him for sitting there while I let my guard down. It's one thing for me to think of something to create and make it happen, but the market is so competitive. There are more artists in New York than you can shake a stick at. If I want to make any money, I really have to be open to commissions. You know, work with people on size and subject matter and everything. Conform to the guidelines they set. And you don't like to be told what to draw? He assumed in a non-judgmental way. It's not that, I said. I'm just nervous about it. I have enough insecurities when I sit down to make art as it is, even when the subject matter is my idea. I still worry that my stuff isn't good enough to sell. Oh, you must be kidding, he said. I saw for myself how talented you are, sweetheart. You studied at Columbia. I smiled and glanced downward. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. I paused and sighed thoughtfully. Thankfully, so far, I've had enough confidence in my ability to keep pushing forward. But sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I just feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm constantly making it up as I go along. Mr. Steiner let out a hearty laugh at that. He slapped a hand to my knee. Oh, Lou, honey, all of life is winging it. None of us know what we're doing. That feeling's not reserved for artists. I'm in banking. I've had a 30-year career and I still feel insecure and incapable all the time. I press through that feeling. I always have. That's just what you have to do. He took a breath and patted my knee again. Wing it, wing it, wing it. Take the commissions. Do your best. People will respond to your best. I sighed and smiled at him. Thank you. He returned my smile. What else? He asked. You said you had stuff. Stuff's plural. Stuff is not plural. I said, squinting playfully at him. I think in this case it might be, he said. I guess my parents are a little bit of a factor, I said. They're not asking me for anything, but they sacrificed a lot for me to be able to go to school, and I would love to be able to pay them back. Maybe I'd give myself a hard time for not studying something that would have been a little more lucrative. If it makes you feel any better, it's still as difficult to be a success at something lucrative as it is to be one at something not so lucrative. They don't go handing out millions to people who graduate with a business degree. I let out a little laugh at that. I guess that makes me feel better. It should make you feel better, he said, because it's true. None of us know what we're doing. You just keep pressing forward in spite of that. And because he was so kind, and it was actually making me feel a little better to talk about things, I went and blurted something I would never in a million years have normally said. Plus, I kissed a guy I didn't even like at the wedding party just now. Not even as a friend? He asked, with a slightly worried look on his face like someone might have done something to make me uncomfortable. I smiled and shook my head. It was a mutual kiss, I said but I only did it because I had a crush on someone else. Joe Spicer, perhaps? He asked with one eyebrow raised a little. I got anxious the instant I heard his name. Who? What? Did I kiss Joe? No. He tried not to smile. And that was the problem? He asked slowly. No, I said. I was a terrible liar, and the word came out like more of a question than a statement. Mr. Steiner smiled. He's always been such a dynamic person, even as a really young man. I didn't even say anything about Joe. You're just assuming. Okay, he said, smiling with his hands raised. Why would you even think it was him? I asked. He shrugged. He was the most eligible young man at the party. Besides Grant McEwen, and I think Grant might have been the one you regrettably kissed when the two of you took off before dinner. I felt a wave of embarrassment imagining everyone talking about the two of us disappearing together. Did everyone know about that? I asked. No, he assured me. I just happened to be walking through the kitchen and saw you two headed toward the supply closet. I assumed you weren't looking for towels. I'm sorry about that, I said, feeling my cheeks flush. 
He patted my knee again. Sweetheart, there's no need to be sorry. And there's no need to feel bad for not having it all together all the time. Life is a constant series of falling apart. The question is whether or not you can keep putting it back together. He paused and tilted his head at me. There was a guy in the Bible named Paul, who wrote a passage about something he called a thorn in his flesh, something he really wished he could get to go away. Anyway, Paul asked God about it several times, and God said to him, My grace is sufficient. I've heard of that. I thought he was talking about being sick. Not necessarily. No matter what's going on around you or inside of you, you have to remember the simple fact that God's grace is sufficient for it. Period. It's a truth I return to time and time again in life. He's with you. He loves you. And you can lean on him no matter what kind of thorn you have. He doesn't let you experience those things for no reason. Yeah, but sometimes mine are probably self-inflicted. He reached up and put a hand on my shoulder. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to have it all together, sweetheart. Nobody's got it all together. He gestured around him. Look at me. I'm happily married. I live in this amazing house, and I can assure you I do not have it all together. Not even close. I can mentally melt down at the drop of a hat if I let myself, he said lightheartedly. He lightly pinched me with a smile. I can get you an anxiety attack on demand, basically. I giggled and gave him a playful but skeptical glare. Surely you've got it all together living in a place like this, I said. Nope, he said. Been winging it all along. Seriously. Fight your battles and put yourself back together just like you're doing. I smiled at him. Thank you. You're welcome, he said. Listen, I can tell you have a good head on your shoulders, Lou. And your art's good. My wife and I know a lot about art, and you're the real deal. I didn't tell you this earlier, but we're familiar with your man Theo, who started S&S. He knows what he's doing. You wouldn't have a spot in his place if he didn't see something in you. He must believe in you. It's me I'm working on, I said. He smiled. Get used to it, because you'll continue to do it your whole life. I shook my head and smiled at him. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. He let out a laugh. Are you kidding? I'm the one who should be thanking you. I'm going to look back on this talk one day when your stuff's worth millions. I couldn't stop a smile from spreading across my face at his kind words. And for what it's worth, sweetheart, Joe would be one lucky man to have you. My heart leapt, but I tried not to react. I never said anything about Joe, I said. He patted my shoulder and then stood with a little groan. I know, but even still, Joe would be a lucky man to have you. I didn't say anything to that. I just smiled at him and shook my head as we began walking toward the door. I want you to stay here if you like, but I reckon you should go out with the rest of them since you only have one night left in Dublin. You reckon I should? I asked. He nodded. I'd be winging it, I said. Might as well get used to it, he said. He shrugged and raised his elbow like a chicken flapping its wing. I thought he was calling me chicken at first, but then I realized he was telling me to wing it. I gave him a sincere smile. It really feels good to smile, Mr. Steiner. I know that sounds dramatic or whatever, but I mean it. Thank you for letting me say all that just now. I'm just pumping you up for when I get you to do a commission for me. Any time, I said with a smile. Add a girl, he said, throwing a fake punch at my chin. Thank you, I repeated. Don't mention it, he said. I seriously won't if you don't mind, I said, causing him to smile. Dinner was amazing, I said as he reached for the door. The whole wedding, really. You guys really outdid yourselves. I paused and shrugged. I guess I can't really say that since I've never been here and have nothing to compare it to, but I think you outdid yourselves. You outdid anything I've ever seen, that's for sure. He let out a chuckle. You're just the sweetest little thing, Lou. I smiled. Remind me what your last name was so we can keep an eye out for your work. We're always looking to add to our collection. And a beautiful collection it is, I said. It's Osborne. Lou Osborne? Were your parents rock stars or something? Not even close, I said with a smile. 
My dad's literally a garbage man. Why did you say literally? Because I didn't want you to think I was joking. I wouldn't have thought that, he said. There's nothing wrong with being a bin man. My dad was a plumber. He likes his job, I said. And my parents do okay. My mom has a job and everything. It's not like they need my help. I just feel like it'd be nice to repay them eventually. I'm almost sure they're more concerned with you being happy. I grinned. I know they are. Mr. Steiner rubbed my shoulder. Lou's an interesting name, too, he said. I meant to ask you about it earlier, and I forgot. Luli, I said. Like Julie, with an L. I have a sister who's two years older than me. My parents were planning on calling me Julie. My mom was still carrying me when they told my sister, and she couldn't pronounce it. So they changed their mind and named me Luli instead. Everyone called me Lou, though, right from the start. One corner of his mouth turned up as he contemplated that. What's your sister's name? Jennifer, I said. I smiled. Although sometimes when I'm mad at her, I call her Lenifer or Lenny. Mr. Steiner laughed. I like that, he said, nodding. He shrugged. But I also like Lou. I like you too, I said, misunderstanding him on purpose. He smirked at me and waved from over his shoulder as he walked away, and I went back into the room to make up my mind about going to the pub. Chapter 5 Frankly, I was afraid to change my mind about going with them to the pub. Lately, I was afraid of everything and nothing at the same time. I wasn't sure what would happen with Grant, and I wasn't sure how everyone would respond when I went down to meet them after I said I wasn't going. But I decided to do it in spite of my uncertainties. I told myself to wing it, like Mr. Steiner said. I sent a text to Rebecca to let her know that I was going with them. I wasn't doing it just so that she would know about travel arrangements. I texted to let her know I was coming because I knew it would keep me from backing out. I changed into dressy, dark jeans with a few layered tops and a light scarf, figuring I could take a layer off if it was warm when we got there. My hair had been down for the wedding, but I pulled it up into a loose bun. It was the best I could do with the time and supplies I had on hand, and I reminded myself of that as I walked toward the great room where everyone was gathered. I could see as I approached that there were roughly 15 people spread out in clusters. We're the only ones going, Emily said, raising her hand from a group that was gathered near the exit to the foyer. I smiled and headed in their direction. I walked by another group on the way, which consisted of the Steiners and Sarah's parents. Going out with the others? Mrs. Steiner asked as I passed. I think I am, I said. I shrugged. When in Dublin, I added, since I was a huge dork who filled silences when I was nervous. When in Dublin, Mrs. Steiner yelled in her thick Irish accent. She held her fist in the air when she said it, and everyone standing nearby instinctively lifted their fists and made a sound of agreement. We were laughing at the silliness of it all as I walked away, headed for the group of people who were standing with Emily. Rebecca reached out to touch my shoulder in a somewhat awkward but sweet greeting. I patted her back and smiled. I was still apprehensive about going, but I told myself they were all winging it just like me. Joe stood on the opposite end of the circle of people, looking like a male model in his street clothes. I only glanced at him for a second before focusing on Emily, who was standing right next to him looking blonde and beautiful with a career in finance. I smiled at her before letting my eyes find Drake, who waved at me with the same hand that was holding a small camera. Slumming it? I asked, referring to the tiny camera he was holding. He chuckled. I decided not to lug around my camera, and this is better than my phone. I'm just playing. I'm surprised you're taking that. I thought you'd take the night off. I am, he said, smiling. That's how much I like taking pictures. I've got the night off, and I'm still bringing my camera. I think this is all of us if you guys are ready, Joe said. He stepped forward, and we collectively jumped to attention, ready and willing to follow him wherever he went. There were only six of us who decided to go, so we got by with taking the rental SUV, which Eli drove. Joe sat in the front with him, giving him directions, and the rest of us piled into the back. It took the better part of an hour to get to the pub, but that was because Joe led us on a detour to see some other places in Dublin first. I was sitting in the very back with Rebecca. 
but I heard the people in the front two rows having a conversation about wanting to come back to Ireland when they had more time to explore. We were relieved to find a good spot to park within a block of the pub, and the six of us filed out and headed in that direction. I still wasn't used to the subtle differences between Dublin and American cities, and I was charmed by my surroundings as we went inside. I noticed a lack of plastic. Everything seemed to be made of stone and wood as we made our way inside the pub, and it gave me a warm feeling. The live music only added to that sensation. There was a small section off to the right, near the stage where people were dancing and swaying, but it wasn't nearly as disorderly as I had imagined. Joe had been in touch with Grant, who had a couple of tables reserved for us when we arrived. Grant shot me a delighted smile when he realized I was there, and I returned it, trying to be friendly and non-committal at the same time. Two of his friends were with him, both of whom had been at the wedding. We greeted one another and talked about what a cool atmosphere it was as we found seats around the tables he had reserved. We sat around, listening to the music, and interacting with the locals sitting around us. We had been there for what must have been about an hour, when Joe mentioned wanting to dance. Emily was sitting right beside him and was happy to volunteer before he even got the statement out of his mouth. Rebecca and Eli joined them, leaving me and Drake with the crew from Ireland. Grant and his group knew some of the people sitting around us, so they were content to hang out at the table while the others went to dance. I'm going to go use the ladies' room, I announced as I stood. A few of them acknowledged me with a wave or glance, but otherwise didn't respond. I glanced toward the makeshift dance floor on my way to the restroom and saw that Joe and Emily were trying to find a spot to dance at the edge of the action. I watched them long enough to see her lean up and whisper something to him. He smiled and said something back to her, and the sight of it made my heart drop. I turned and began my trek to the ladies' room at a much faster pace. It infuriated me to want something I couldn't have. That helpless feeling I told Mr. Steiner about was revisiting me, and I reminded myself that I was strong enough not to go down that rabbit hole. I said a quick prayer asking God to give me something to distract me from this man, and it was seriously and miraculously at that very moment when I found that distraction in the form of a sharp shooting pain in the palm of my hand. I had absentmindedly reached out to run my hand along a rail as I turned my corner on the way to the restroom, when I felt the pain. I stopped in my tracks and stared down at the heel of my hand. Wall sconces provided the only light in the hallway. I happened to be standing right under one of them, so I was relatively sure I wasn't seeing things, but it was still hard to believe. Right in the base of my hand, on the pinky side, was a wooden splinter. It was not a full inch long, but it was definitely, no doubt, 100% over a half inch. I had a few splinters in my life, but never one like this. I took a long blink, hoping I was seeing things and that it would be gone if I kept my eyes closed for a few seconds. I had no such luck. It was still there when I opened them. It was really dark wood, so dark that it almost appeared black. I glanced at the rail, wondering how in the world a piece of it ended up in my hand. It had gone in at just the right angle that I could see the whole thing under the surface of my palm. I stared at it in wonder at how it had broken off. I honestly wasn't sure how it had happened. I had to examine it more closely to even see which way it had gone in. I could see which side was open by the tiniest little speck of blood right at the entry point. It had been hurting before, but inspecting it and seeing that blood, insignificant as it was, only made it worse. I felt lightheaded at the thought of trying to take it out. It was by far the biggest and most intimidating foreign object that had ever ended up under the surface of my skin, and I had no idea where to begin to get it out. Do I need a doctor for this? I asked the person walking by. I was facing the light and staring at the heel of my hand, so I couldn't see who it was when I spoke. I only heard that someone was walking behind me. Do you need a doctor for what? A man's voice asked. He spoke with an American accent and came up behind me with familiarity. I knew it was Joe right away, and my already racing heart began pounding in my chest. He stepped even closer, staring at the heel of my hand from over my shoulder. What? Is that? he asked after a few seconds. I shifted to glance at him. It's a thorn in my flesh, 
I said. I hadn't meant it to be funny, so I was staring at him with a serious expression when his face broke into a grin. A thorn in your flesh, eh? Yes, I said. I held my hand out for him to inspect. There's a big thorn right there. Can you see it? Oh, I see it all right. I was just wondering how it ended up in your flesh. Where did it come from? I gestured at the railing that was attached to the wall. Right there, I said. I just put my hand on the rail and it bit me. Do I need a doctor? Joe took my hand in his and inspected it in the light. A smile touched the corner of his lips like he thought it was cute that I was so worried about it. I think it just needs some tweezers. I shook my head and pulled my hand away. I'm not digging in there to get that, I said. It's deep. I think it needs somebody who knows what they're doing. Eli knows what he's doing, Joe said. I forgot he's a doctor. He is a doctor, but we don't need him for this, Joe said. I can take that out, no problem. And you happen to have a pair of tweezers in your pocket? I asked. He smiled, and I felt heat rise to my face. I hadn't expected to end up in a completely foreign land with a big slice of wood in my hand, so it was impossible for me to try to seem composed. I felt a sudden flash of heat like I sometimes got when I was extremely nervous. A hot flash, if you will. I found myself feeling like I needed some air. I grabbed the scarf that had been hanging around my neck and unwound it, sighing with relief as I began fanning myself with it. I was so overwhelmed that I was breathing at the pace of someone who had just run up a flight of stairs. I took a few deep, calming breaths and tried to get myself together. And then I realized that Joe had just been standing there watching me. He was staring at my neck right at the place where my scarf had been. I tried to concentrate on slowing my breathing, but it was hard with him in such close proximity and looking at me like he saw something really interesting. What? I said, bringing my fingertips up to my neck at the spot where he was staring. I thought maybe I had something on there. He let his eyes meet mine for a second, but then he looked at my neck again. He reached up and let his fingertip touch my neck right under my jaw. It's just a little splinter, he whispered teasingly. I know, I said pulling away from him a little since I wasn't sure why he was saying that. I just got overheated for a second. I can see how fast your heart's beating, he said, touching my neck with his fingertip one more time. There was no way I was going to tell him that my heart was pounding for other reasons, so I just let out a little laugh and draped my scarf around my neck again. Joe pulled back and stared at me with a thoughtful expression. He had never really looked at me that way before, and I wondered what he was thinking. He started to say something and then seemed to change his mind. I wondered what he was thinking. Let me see it, he said, holding his hand out. I put my hand in his, and he tilted my palm toward the light so he could get a better look at it. I was shaking, but I could tell he thought it was from the splinter because he tenderly held my hand in both of his to steady it. This is a thorn in your flesh, he said, smiling a little as he repeated my words. I told you, I said. Chapter Six Joe held my hand under the light and closely inspected the splinter. How in the world did this thing end up in your hand, Lou? I stared at it, feeling shaken. It was a thin black line that looked like it had been drawn with a sharpie. Joe tilted it to the light to see if it was visually raised, which it wasn't. It was protruding a little bit, but it must have been buried under several layers of skin because it was barely sticking up at all. That speck of blood was so scarcely visible that Joe had to squint down at it like I did to figure out which direction it had gone in. I could tell that's what he was doing. I gazed at the side of his flawless face as he studied my hand. It was the exact perfect way to be stared at by Joe. I had all his attention, yet he wasn't looking at my face so he didn't know I was blushing. I think we can get it with some tweezers, he said after a thorough evaluation. Do you have any? Tweezers? I asked. I stared at him in disbelief, and he returned it with a shrug and an amused grin. I'll bet somebody has some tweezers with them, he said. He held on to my hand even though he was no longer looking at it. I rarely, if ever, had been this close to Joe. We'd been in the same room lots of times, but never in proximity this close. 
His eyes were literally the most penetrating things I had ever seen, and the effect they had on me was even greater up close. Don't you think I should go to a doctor or something? I glanced at my hand. I mean, that's pretty big. It might need stitches. He laughed a little at that, but both of us got quiet for a few seconds when a lady passed by, headed to the restroom. You won't need stitches, he assured me. He stared at it as if to make sure of that diagnosis before shaking his head casually. I wish you would let me do it, but I'm going to let my brother take a look at it just to make you feel better. He took me by the wrist, carrying my hand right in front of him like he was transporting precious cargo. I could feel his chest with my arm and hand, which was a welcome distraction from the searing sensation in the palm of my hand. We walked back toward the crowd of people near the small stage. Emily caught sight of us first because Eli and Rebecca were both preoccupied with the band. She made a curious expression when she saw Joe holding my hand to his chest. He gestured to his brother, who was on the other side of Emily, and she turned to get Eli's attention for us. By the time that all went down, we had already made our way to the place where they were standing. She's got a thorn in her flesh, Joe said as we approached. It was loud where they were standing, and he said it at a volume they couldn't quite hear. What? Eli asked, leaning over his wife and nearly yelling over the music. A splinter, Joe said. He held out my hand so that the others could see the black line along the heel of it. The women both cringed, and Eli stepped toward me to take my hand from Joe. Where'd you get this? He asked, staring down at it. The handrail? I guess you'll be wanting me to take it out, he said dryly. Unless you think I should go see a doctor. Eli glanced at me with the tiniest hint of a smile. I am a doctor, he said. I know, but we're in a pub. Nobody's got tweezers or stitches if... Actually, I do have tweezers, Rebecca said, coming to join the huddle and already digging in her purse. Come on, I'll bet we can find a first aid kit that has everything we need. Eli said, pulling me toward the bar with him and leaving the others to follow. Do you think it's going to need stitches? I asked as we walked. Why would it need stitches? He asked. It seems pretty deep in there. I'm just going to pull it out the way it went in and put a bandage on it. You'll be good as new in about two minutes. It's a big one, I said. Yep. At least it's skimming the surface and not going straight in, right? I cringed at the thought of something this long going straight into my skin. I'm already freaked out enough as it is, I said. Are you sure it's okay to just pull it right out in a pub? Of course it's okay. Eli talked to the pub manager, and we got access to a first aid kit and a clean towel. Eli brought the supplies back to our table and set up a makeshift doctor's office where he sanitized his wife's tweezers and my skin with an alcohol swab. Rebecca and Grant both got out their phones and began shining flashlights directly on my hand so that Eli could see what he was doing. Drake offered to do it if needed, but he seemed more interested in taking pictures. I couldn't watch. I shifted in my seat so that I could turn away. There were at least 10 or 15 onlookers standing around, but nobody was in the seat directly next to me. I stared at the empty space on the padded bench, hoping and praying I didn't pass out in front of all these nice people. It's just a little splinter, Eli assured me, using his best bedside manner. I know but I just want it to get out, I answered without looking at him. Somebody come hold this girl's other hand, Eli said. I got that, I heard Joe say. I knew Eli was saying it because he didn't want me to flail while he worked, but I was happy to have Joe next to me either way. I was sitting on the side of the table that had a bench seat, and Joe slid in next to me. My splintered hand was extended across the table in front of Eli as I turned the other way, staring directly at Joe's chest. He moved closer until our legs were touching, and my forehead was resting on his chest. He took my free hand in his, holding it firmly as if to assure his brother that he would prevent me from thrashing about. I honestly wish I could have enjoyed the contact more, but I was anxious about the splinter coming out. I closed my eyes and rested my cheek on Joe's chest, and he put his hand around my head, holding me close. The whole thing took about one minute. There was some pressure and some talking where Eli told his wife to adjust her flashlight, but mostly Joe kept his hand over my ear, and I just stayed there, imagining I was doing something other than having a giant splinter extracted from my hand. The music continued, 
but there was complete silence around our table as Eli worked on my hand. There was some poking and pressure, followed by some stinging, and then ultimately a feeling of relief. I heard the crowd's amazed reaction, so I figured all or most of it had come out. There came a cold, wet sensation on my hand, followed by some pressure around my whole hand. Joe spoke near my ear. He's got it out, he said. He might be putting a bandage on it, but he's done. It's out. I sat straight up while trying to leave my hand in the same place. As glorious as it had been to take refuge in Joe's arms, I obviously couldn't continue resting my head on his chest now that it was over. I was relieved that it wasn't as painful as I thought it might be. Did the whole thing come out? I asked. I should hope so, Eli said, lifting the side of the towel so I could inspect the splinter. I gasped. Oh my gosh, seriously? That's big. Was that it? Everyone standing around answered me at the same time, agreeing that it was the object that had been lodged in my hand. They began remarking on it and leaning over to get a look, so Eli just took the towel out from under my hand and handed it to his wife so she could pass it around. He glanced at me as he continued bandaging my hand. I rinsed it with some sterile solution and I'm putting some ointment. It came out clean, though. It'll heal up quickly. Eli flashed the heel of my hand at me just before he applied the bandage so that I could see the place where the splinter had been. The black line was replaced with a red one, but he was right. It looked clean. I smiled. Thank you so much, I said. I feel like I owe you something for doing that. Yeah, right, Joe said, teasing his brother. That was fun and he knows it. I tried to talk her into letting me do it, but she wanted a real doctor. Joe rolled his eyes and made quotes when he said real doctor, and everyone laughed at him. Just as this was happening, the towel got passed back in my general direction. Grant held it in front of me, and I reached out and took it from him with a thankful smile. Now I kind of wish I would have watched him do it, I said to no one in particular as I stared at it. Drake heard me and said something about getting pictures of the whole thing. I knew he had, and I was happy about that because I would definitely want to see them later. Once the action was over and Eli had all his supplies gathered, everyone went back to doing their thing, making conversation with each other and listening to the music. Joe was still sitting on the other side of me, so I shifted so I could talk to him. He was glancing at his phone, but he smiled and put it away when he saw me out of the corner of his eye. Thank you, I said. That was crazy. He smiled and let his eye roam over my face. It really was. I was trying not to make it seem like a big deal so you wouldn't get worried, but that thing was huge. I told you, I said with wide eyes. It didn't really sink in on any spiritual level, not yet anyway. But I did think it was cool and odd that I had just had a conversation about a thorn in the flesh, and now I had a literal one. I think it's too small to keep for a souvenir, or I would, I told him. Why would it be too small? Because it would just get lost. I mean, it's not really big enough to put in my pocket or my purse without losing track of it. So ask for a baggie, Joe said. I mean, if you want to keep it, he added, making a funny face and sounding uncertain as to why I'd think of it as a souvenir in the first place. I stared at him, and he stared right back at me, both of us wearing a little grin. We just stayed there for a few long seconds, listening to the music and chaos going on around us and having no idea what the other person was thinking. I felt connected with Joe on some new level, like the splinter incident had brought us together somehow. Not that we were ready to ride off into the sunset or anything, but something had shifted slightly with us. I could tell by the way he stared at me. We were sitting there not saying anything to each other for I don't know how long when Eli said, Are you coming? One glance in his direction and we could see that he and Rebecca were back on their way to the dance floor and wanted to know if Joe was coming. Emily was standing next to them, regarding Joe with an expectant grin. He glanced at me, but before he could say anything, I said, Oh, yeah, go, for sure. I still need to go to the restroom anyway. I never made it there the first time. Thank you for helping me get this thing out, though. Joe smiled at me before nodding with a finger in the air to his brother, indicating that he was on his way. You're welcome, he said, but all I did was go get my brother. And you helped me hide my eyes, I said. He was in the process of standing when he leaned over to speak to me with an easy grin. 
That was my favorite part, he said. He turned and walked off after that, looking cool as a cucumber while I was left sitting there, feeling dazed and weak in the knees. Would you mind a dance? Grant asked. It's our last night here, Drake said, trying to encourage me as he made his way to the dance floor with a young woman from a nearby table. I smiled at him, and he waved his hand, encouraging me to follow them. I glanced at Grant, who shrugged and stuck his hand out to entice me. I decided to do it. I really didn't even need to use the restroom, and Drake was right. Who knew when, if ever, I would be able to go to Ireland again? I knew myself well enough to know I would regret this moment later if I didn't go out there and dance. I smiled and took Grant's hand as we made our way to the little makeshift stage area. Some people were swaying and dancing to the music on their own, while other couples danced in a waltz-type position. It was chaotic and packed in that area, so no one really paid attention to what anyone else was doing. Grant and I found a place near the wall, and he turned me in his arms so that we were all set up to dance. I had danced with him a few other times at the wedding, so I was comfortable. I knew he was a gentleman, and I found it easy to relax with him. It helped that he was handsome. That gave me a little satisfaction, since I had just witnessed Joe take off with Emily. I was aware that Joe and Emily were with the others who were close by, but I purposely avoided any glances in their direction while Grant and I danced. That song drew to a close, and a slower one began, causing everyone who had been dancing to either stop or switch motions to adjust to the slower rhythm. I chose not to slow dance with Grant, just because I could see that the smile he was wearing was slightly warmer than the one I was returning to him. I shifted out of Grant's grasp, adjusting my scarf so that I would have something to do with my hands. Chapter 7 I had just finished dancing with Grant and was still standing next to him, watching the Irish band play one of their slower numbers when I heard a man's voice. I didn't know you were coming over here, Joe said. His voice came from behind me, so it took me a few seconds to even register what was going on. There was a pause while I contemplated who had been the one to speak and who they had spoken to. I turned when I realized that it was Joe and he was talking to me. Joe's perfect face was staring back at me, and I smiled at him by instinct. I thought you were staying over there, he said, gesturing to the table. Going to the restroom or whatever. I looked over his shoulder, expecting to find Emily. I saw her a few feet behind him, but she wasn't looking at us. I knew she was probably trying not to look on purpose, but I didn't really care. I focused on Joe again. I expected him to say something, but he just stood there and stared at me. Grant took a step closer so he could join us. I could feel him standing there beside me, so I glanced at him to find that he was smiling in Joe's direction. They're good, aren't they? Grant asked Joe in his Irish accent. Yeah, Joe said. I like him. He looked at me with a conspiratorial glance that said he didn't want to make small talk about the band. I smiled at him and shook my head a little. I didn't get to dance with Lou at the wedding he said, regarding Grant in a friendly but impassive way. I think she owes me a dance. Do you owe the man a dance? Grant asked, looking at me and playing along. I shrugged. I might have said I owed him one for the splinter situation, I said. Grant lifted his hand in surrender. Don't let me get in the way of your agreement, he said. I glanced at Joe and he lifted his eyebrows at me, offering me his hand. There were people everywhere, and I had to turn to the side as I took a step toward him. I vaguely registered Grant walking off to head back to the table, which made me absentmindedly consider Emily and her whereabouts, but they were just passing thoughts because the next thing I knew, Joe was pulling me into his arms. I did not think you were coming over here, he said. He took one of my hands in his and put his other one around the small of my back. He didn't hold me tightly against him but we were close enough that our bodies brushed continually as we swayed slowly to the music. I was too nervous to speak for about the first half a minute. What did you do with your thorn? Joe asked, leaning in to speak near my ear. It's in my pocket, I said. I took my hand from off of his shoulder and patted the front pocket of my jeans. He glanced down there and then smiled at me. 
feeling reckless, he said. He was referring to the bagless splinter in my pocket, but I was feeling pretty reckless all the way around. I felt reckless just being in his arms. Total and complete recklessness going on in my pocket right now, I said. It's probably already lost or broken by now. Well, your time would have been more wisely spent getting a bag for your souvenir than it was dancing with that guy. I pulled back and stared at him with a face that reflected my curiosity. I wanted to say he sounded jealous, but I didn't. I thought, of all people, you'd be proud of me for dancing, I said, since you're the seize the moment type and all. I'm not proud of you dancing with that blasted Irishman, he said. I giggled and shook my head. Grant's a nice guy, I said. I danced with him like 20 times at the wedding. Joe tilted his head, staring at me. Well, that was a waste of time too, I guess. I laughed and squinted at him. Who says? Me. It's not really your place to say whether or not my time with Mr. McEwen was wasted, though, now is it? Mr. McEwen? Joe asked with a face of distaste and disbelief that made me smile. You know his last name? I shifted my eyes from corner to corner like I was missing something. I pretty much hung out with him all afternoon, I said. Joe and I swayed back and forth for a few steps without speaking. I wondered if he had even heard me. When he finally spoke, he said, I think we might have both wasted our time today, Lou. That song was just drawing to a close when he said that, and the crowd applauded, spurring me to let go of Joe and do the same. I could see out of the corner of my eye that Joe was clapping at about half the speed I was. I turned to smile at him. I had a whole chain of thoughts about his name as I took him in. I never thought I'd be so smitten with a man named Joe. I had heard my father use the term average Joe a few times during my childhood, so that was what I always thought of when I heard that name. Average. There was nothing average about this, Joe. He was the most unaverage thing I had ever laid eyes on. Hello, he said, seeing that I was lost in thought. I motioned to the band and continued to clap with the crowd. I like this, I said, since I wasn't about to tell him what I had been thinking. I felt like Emily might walk up at any second so I turned to glance in her direction before looking at Joe again. I thought you were going to dance with Emily, I said, feeling nervous. He smiled patiently at me. The band leader made some joke I didn't even hear before leading into the next song. I'm not here with anybody named Emily, Joe said, leaning in to speak near my ear. He stood up straight and regarded me with a serious expression, waiting to hear what I'd say. I smiled. Yeah, but she was waiting on you to dance. And we danced, he said. I danced with her right before I danced with you. I did it while you were getting along with Mr. McElroy. McEwen. McWay over there while I'm standing next to you. You're funny. You're Lou. I smiled. We sound like Dr. Seuss. He shrugged like there were worse things we could sound like. And I giggled at the thought of our dialogue. Did you say McWay over there? Yes, I did he said, cracking a small smile as he grabbed my hand and started moving me to the rhythm of the song the band was playing. You're trying to dance with me, I said, stating the obvious as he grabbed my hands and drew me near. I'm succeeding, he said, spinning me around in his arms. I laughed at the noisy, colorful blur that happened as a result of being twirled around, and the next thing I knew, I landed in Joe's arms. He smiled down at me, causing my blood to run warm. I was so glad he was holding me because I really don't think my knees would have worked if I had tried to stand on my own. Joe made sure I was steady before beginning to move me around, leading me by the shoulders in perfect time with the music. Joe and I danced for the next four or five songs. Maybe it was more like eight. We danced for quite a while. We talked some, and sometimes we were quiet. He set the tone. He set the pace. He danced with me, and not the other way around. At first, I just tried to play it cool, not step on his toes and answer questions when he asked them, but as the evening went on, I got more and more comfortable. Something had definitely shifted between us. We were in the middle of one of those moments when it seemed like we were both recognizing that change when Rebecca tapped me on the shoulder. She said we were leaving soon, since she and Eli were tired. 
Joe and I finished the song before heading back to the table to meet everyone else. Somewhere in the very recesses of my mind, I thought Joe and I might just start holding hands and being boyfriend and girlfriend after dancing to all those songs in a row. But that didn't happen. I walked next to Joe, and he walked next to me. But we kept our hands to ourselves. I knew that's what we would do, but it felt good to dream that he might sweep me into his arms and declare his love for me to everyone at the pub. I was smiling at myself for even imagining such a thing as we made our way to the table. Pretty happy for someone who just went through surgery, Eli said, teasing me about my smile. At least I had a doctor in the house, I said, patting him on the shoulder. It took us about 15 minutes to say goodbye to everyone and make our way to the SUV. It crossed my mind to worry about Emily or Grant and what they might have thought about Joe and me dancing the whole time, but our departure happened so quickly that I didn't really have time to consider it. I climbed into the very back again, and this time, Drake got back there with me. We had only been in the vehicle for a few minutes when he turned on his little handheld camera and began looking at the pictures on the digital screen. I leaned over to take a look, and Drake adjusted, scooting toward me so that I could see. Joe was in the front, giving his brother directions, but he had turned and was talking to Rebecca and Emily, who were in the middle row. I could hear them discussing an old church that we were driving past, but I wanted to see the pictures Drake had on his camera, so I leaned in to share the view of the camera with him instead of paying attention to sightseeing. We both propped against each other, focusing on the small camera that he held in front of us. Drake clicked through a ton of photos at a quick pace, until he reached some from my splinter extraction. We both peered down at the camera, giggling and cringing at the picture of the huge piece of wood being removed. I kept it, I said, turning to stare at him with wide eyes. We were sitting so close that he had to pull back to focus on me. You have it? I nodded. I think so. I tried to keep it in my pocket. I assume it's still there. Well, reach in there and find out, Drake said. I leaned over even further in front of Drake so that I could dig in my left pocket. I was concentrating on feeling around for it when I heard Joe from the front seat. Don't you guys want to see the river? Drake and I both looked out of the window and saw a body of water. That's cool, I said. Here, Lulu, let me help you find it, Drake said, having no interest at all in commenting about the river. He leaned in front of me. He put his arm in the right trajectory like he might be digging in my pants pocket but he kept his hand on the seat near my leg. That guy is so jealous right now, Drake whispered so quietly that absolutely no one else in the vehicle could hear. I have no idea where that thing is, Drake added in a louder voice, wiggling around like he was still vigorously digging. I found it difficult not to laugh. What exactly are you trying to find? Joe asked, turning around from the front seat. I hid behind Drake because I was smiling at how annoyed Joe sounded. Her splinter, Drake said. She put it in her pocket. His eyes widened as he leaned in front of me even more, still pretending to help me look. She doesn't need you digging in her pocket, Joe said. She can do that herself. Drake's jaw dropped, which made me want to laugh. I pinched him in an effort to make him stop, but it didn't work because I giggled in spite of my best efforts not to. I got it, I said to Drake and anyone else who was paying attention. I pushed Drake away, even though he hadn't really been helping me in the first place. Eli asked Joe something about directions, and Joe turned his attention to helping his brother. I looked at Drake as I carefully pulled my hand out of my pocket. I'm just going to find it when we get back, I whispered, shaking my head. I'll find it later. I don't want to put my hand in there and get poked again. Drake held the camera in front of us, but he made a funny, wide-eyed expression at me when I glanced at him. He is seriously jealous, he said. He likes you. Uh-uh, I whispered. Drake clicked to the next picture. It was one of me with my head buried in Joe's chest while Eli worked on removing my splinter. I took the camera out of Drake's hand, staring down at it. I got a few like this, he whispered. He clicked to the next one, and I inched closer to inspect it. Joe had his hand on my head, holding me close while I squeezed my eyes shut tight. My stomach flipped at the sight of him holding me like that. I wished I hadn't been so preoccupied with the splinter to fully enjoy the moment when it was happening. I guess you guys don't care about all this stuff we're passing, Joe said. 
He spoke loudly enough that I knew he was talking to Drake and me. He had no idea what we were doing, only that we were huddled in close toward the middle of the back seat. They're looking at pictures on his camera, Rebecca said, glancing over her shoulder at us. I looked at Drake, who widened his eyes just slightly at me. He was just showing me the pictures from getting my splinter out, I said. Sure, I didn't owe Joe an explanation, but I loved that he cared enough to want one. Chapter 8 It only took us about 30 minutes to get back to the house after we left the pub. Drake and I looked through all of the photos he had on his point-and-shoot camera. He said he had at least a thousand more from the wedding and promised to print some of his favorites on a portable printer he brought with him so that we could have some paper photographs to look through on the plane. Before I knew it, the six of us were pulling up at the Steiner's stone mansion. Joe was sitting in the passenger's seat, and I watched from my place in the back as he climbed out of the vehicle and turned to hold the door behind him. Rebecca and Emily climbed out of the middle row, and since I was stuck in the back till they got out, I just sat there and watched them. Joe waited for them to get out, at which point he stepped closer, pressing the button to make the seat slide forward, even though Drake was perfectly capable of doing that from his place in the back. Joe stepped to the side to let Drake out. I was relatively sure they were making some appraising eye contact at each other, but I paid attention to climbing out of the seat instead of their male dynamics. Joe's hand came out to take mine, and I gave it to him so he could steady me as I got out. I gained my balance and ran a hand through my hair as he closed the door. We all walked in at the same time, but I couldn't help but notice that Joe stuck relatively close to me. I'm going straight to my room to start downloading photos, Drake announced as we made our way into the foyer. We could hear the sound of voices coming from the great room, and before we even went in there, Eli and Rebecca announced that they were also going straight to bed. Once we rounded the corner, we saw three couples. Sarah's parents, along with the Steiners, and Colin's parents were sitting by the huge fireplace on the other side of the room. Joe and I headed in that direction, and so did Emily, who, apparently, wasn't going to bed like the others. There was plenty of open seating near the parents, so the three of us went over there to recount the events of our evening. Joe referred to my splinter as a thorn in my flesh when he brought up that aspect of our story, and this caused Mr. Steiner to perk up and stare at me with a curious expression. I told the whole story of the splinter, digging it out of my pocket and holding it up for all of them to see. I was convinced it was a little bit shorter after the ride in my pocket and all the dancing, but I didn't mention that. It was still an impressive size, and everyone oohed and awed when I displayed it. I was surprised I could find it at all, and I was happy I had something visual to go with the story. We spoke to them for about 20 minutes before Colin's parents mentioned going to bed. The Spicers and Steiners agreed, so we all stood up to follow their lead. Where can Lou and I find a baggie for her little souvenir? Joe asked as we began walking. You keeping your splinter? Saul asked. I thought about it, I said, but I was just going to keep it in my pocket and hope for the best. I can get you something to put it in, darling, Mrs. Steiner said. Her husband agreed to walk with me, and so did Joe but Emily and the others continued to their rooms. The four of us broke away from the pack and headed toward the kitchen. Mrs. Steiner had everything you could think of, so it was with very little effort that she located a tiny plastic baggie with a zip closure. It was perfect. It looked like it was made to carry my splinter. Mr. Steiner kept glancing at me with curiosity at the fact that Joe was sticking so close to me. I'm sure it only added to his curiosity that I got an actual thorn in my flesh but I didn't have anything to tell him. I myself didn't know why Joe was acting the way he was or why I got the splinter. Do you two know how to get back to your rooms? Mr. Steiner asked. Joe nodded, and we thanked them for everything before he and I broke away from them, headed toward our end of the house. I'll walk you to your room before I go up, Joe said as we crossed the living room. I moved upstairs, I said. You did? I knew my new room was close to his, and I was glad that I had to walk up the stairs with him since it meant we could hang out an extra minute or two. Somebody who came from London needed the room I was staying in last night. He came to a stop in an area at the base of the stairs. So you're upstairs now? I nodded, and he held out his arm to walk me up the stairs, 
which were grand and covered with beautiful red floral-patterned carpet. He instantly started talking to me, and we walked at a snail's pace so we wouldn't have to rush our conversation. He had heard me talking about my art and about my upcoming living situation at S&S, but he had a few questions for me about it. We stood and talked at the top of the stairs for another five or ten minutes. That building isn't far from my place, he said, as we finally began making our way down the hallway. I had been to Joe's apartment and was well aware that it was close to S&S. That's right, I said, playing it off like I cared less about it than I really did. You've been to my place, he said, with narrowed eyes at my nonchalance. I shrugged. Have I? I glanced at him and he grimaced even further, causing me to giggle. Oh, yeah, I remember now. Joe smiled and shook his head at me as we came to stand in front of my door. He stretched, which was a sight to behold. Okay, so night, I said. Thanks for taking me to get this. I held up the tiny baggie, and Joe nodded as he leaned against the wall near my door. You're welcome, he said. He stared at me with a smile that said he knew we were saying goodnight. I had fun, I said. I mean, in spite of the splinter and everything. I smiled and shrugged. I'm glad we danced. You're an okay dancer. You're all right, too, he said. He was reserved, but the energy between us was charged. I was relatively sure by the way he looked at me that I wasn't the only one feeling that way. He regarded me with what looked like an almost regretful expression. So I smiled and said, sweet dreams, as I reached for the doorknob. He reached out to stop me by putting a hand to my arm. I've been hanging out with this girl, Chelsea, for a little while now. I felt a gut-clenching pain in my whole midsection when he said those words. I tried not to visibly flinch, but I'm sure I made some sort of facial expression. I shook my head and put a hand out to stop him from speaking. You really don't need to say that, I said. I reached for the doorknob, but again he stopped me with a hand on my arm. I shook it off, glancing at him with a friendly but guarded half-smile. I'm trying to tell you why I don't feel like I can kiss you right now. I'm not. I didn't think we were. I'm not. We're, we're not. That's not at all what I was thinking. He smiled at my jabbering. Okay. Well, I just wanted you to know I was thinking about it, he said. I felt so hurt by hearing the other girl's name that I said, well, I wasn't. He pulled back and looked at me with a little smirk that said he was surprised to hear me say that. All right, then, he said. All right, so night, I said, smiling my best, most genuine smile. It doesn't feel right to just say goodnight and walk away. I'm afraid that's our only option, I said. And honestly, I wasn't expecting anything to happen anyway. I added in an aloof tone, since I was feeling embarrassed and hurt after hearing that girl's name. Okay, well, I guess it was just me then, he said. He smiled and shrugged, but it was obvious that he was disappointed about hearing where I stood. I was too hurt and stubborn to do anything but stick to my resolve at that point. Okay, so night, I said. I smiled and stuck up my hand to offer Joe a high five. He returned it, holding on to me for the briefest of seconds, even though I only intended for us to slap hands. I smiled as I turned to open the door. I knew he wanted to kiss me, and he was stopping himself for the sake of some other girl. I smiled numbly as I turned and went into my room, sharing tense, awkward silence with Joe. I closed the door, and almost instantly I heard a few light knocks. I opened the door a few inches, staring out of the crack. Is there anything going on with you and Drake? I shook my head. No. Why? I was just making sure. Do you have some other boyfriend? Is there anyone else? I had to work to hold back a smile. No, I said. Good. I stuck my tongue out at him playfully. You do, so it doesn't really matter now, does it? I know, but it's still good that you don't. Joe said. He smiled and nudged his chin at me as he started off toward his room. Night, he said. Night. I closed the door behind me, feeling overwhelmed with emotions. Joe looked at me like a man looked at a woman when he wanted to be more than her friend. I had never been the recipient of this type of look from Joe, 
and it took my breath away just thinking about it. I struggled for a few seconds to get my breathing regulated once I heard him walk away. I spent the next little while replying to texts and emails I had missed and watching some TV to wind down, but it had been an extremely full day, and sleep found me within the hour. I knew we were leaving for the airport at noon the following day, so the next morning when I woke up, I just stayed in my room, getting dressed and making sure I had everything packed. Mrs. Steiner was well aware of our departure situation, and she came by my room at 10 a.m. with a cart, offering tea, coffee, and several different types of breakfast pastries. It was just before noon when I came downstairs to meet everyone else. I was dressed long before that, but I was reluctant about seeing Joe, so I stayed in my room for longer than I wanted to. By the time I got downstairs, everyone was already milling about, getting their luggage into vehicles. It was all a bit of a hurried blur. There were lots of us trying to get out the door, so there were always several conversations going on at once. I knew from overhearing some other people talk that Drake had printed some photographs that everyone had been looking at. I didn't make it downstairs in time to look through them before we left, but I knew I would be sitting next to Drake on the plane so I would be able to see them then. Mr. Spicer got held up at customs when one of the officers approached him about getting his daughter on a television show but otherwise we made it to our flight easily. We had the same seating arrangements as we did on the way there. So Drake sat by the window, I sat in the middle, and Emily sat near the aisle. We made surface-level conversation with each other while we went through the process of taking off. But once we were in the air, at cruising altitude, Drake dug in his bag and pulled out the stack of photographs. They were smaller than I expected, maybe three by five or so. These are so cute, I said looking at the first one, which was Sarah running down the staircase with her wedding dress in her hands and her red converse shining in their full glory. I studied it closely, trying to see all the beautiful details. They're from that little printer I carry with me, Drake said. I only have one size option, and I only had 80 sheets with me. I turned over the stack, measuring the thickness of 80 pictures and smiling at the way they shifted in my hand. I need a little printer like this, I said. These are so cute. I switched to the next photo and then glanced at Drake with a smile. I guess it helps that your photos are this beautiful. Drake dusted off his shoulder, making me laugh and bump him with my shoulder before staring down at the pictures again. It took what must have been an hour or so for me to get through them. I inspected each one carefully, talking to Drake and Emily about them and remembering scenes from the wedding. One of them was taken at the pub and I got a longing feeling when I saw all of us sitting around the tables, waving and smiling. I found myself in the picture, and then Joe, and I remembered the splinter and all the dancing that took place after it was taken. That one was the last picture in the stack, and I smiled as I handed them back to Drake. Did you see that one of you and Joe at the pub? He asked, the one with the splinter. No. Are you sure? The one where you were turned away trying not to look, he said. I shook my head. I knew I had looked at them carefully, and I hadn't seen anything like he was describing. I would have definitely remembered that. Unless two of them were stuck together, I said. Chapter 9 Drake proceeded to go through the photographs one by one, trying to find the picture of me getting the splinter removed at the pub. He went through them two times, checking to make sure none were stuck together like I had said. Everybody's been passing them around, Emily said. Maybe a few got left behind. Drake leaned over me to stare at Emily, who was obviously aware of our predicament since we were sitting right next to her. I'm going to count them, Drake said, like the idea had just dawned on him. We were all quiet as he placed picture after picture on his lap, counting in his head. Seventy-eight. Seventy-nine, he said triumphantly. He shook his head. I had eighty four packs of 20, and I used them all. I know exactly what picture is missing because I wasn't even planning on printing any of them from the pub. Those two were so sweet that I had to. Drake paused and showed me the one with all of us sitting around the tables. I'm even in this one, he said. I stared at the photo, locating Drake in the back with a big smile. I looked at myself and at Joe, realizing that we were on opposite ends of the photo. It had been taken before I went to the restroom and got the splinter and I remembered back to the whole chain of events. 
I'm so glad you finally got in one of them, I said after taking a few seconds to look at it again before I handed it back to Drake. Yeah, but I had another one from the pub, he said. Emily leaned in. I saw that one this morning, she said. It showed us all gathered around the table watching Eli work on your hand. That's funny. I wonder why it's not in there. Emily held out her hand and Drake handed her the pictures. She went through them quickly, only searching for the missing one. It's not in there, Drake said. There's 79 and there used to be 80. He sat up in his seat, leaning over me and stretching to try to see toward the front of the plane. Hang on a second, he said, talking to no one in particular. I'll be back in a minute. He got up, giving Emily and me no other choice but to let him get by. Where are you going? I asked. I'll be right back, he whispered, not answering my question. Where's he going? Emily asked dazedly as we both watched Drake walk toward the front of the plane. He stopped a little ways up and knelt down next to a row of seats. My heart pounded as I sat there, speculating that he was talking to Joe. What's he doing? I asked Emily since she had a better vantage point than I did. He's talking to somebody. Who? It might be Eli and Joe and them. I think that's Rebecca on the aisle seat. I sat back and sighed, wondering what in the world Drake was saying. He was gone for another minute, which seemed like an eternity. He smiled on his way back to our row, but his smile changed to a somewhat regretful look as he got closer. What? I whispered when he finally sat down. What was that? I went to see if any of them had that picture, he said. Any of who? Joe, he said. You know, Joe and Eli and them. He plopped his head onto the headrest, peering at me with an expression I couldn't read. What happened? I asked, feeling insane with curiosity. He smiled and shook his head distractedly. Drake what? He has it. Who? Joe, he said. The picture? He nodded. So where is it? He shook his head. He wouldn't give it to me. How do you know he has it? I asked. Because I walked up there and asked him if he had it, and he said yes. So where is it? He wouldn't give it to me. Did you ask him to give it to you? Drake nodded. And he said no? Yes, Drake said simply. Did you really? Drake nodded. What happened exactly? I kneeled down by their row. Joe was sitting way by the window. I asked him if he had the picture of Eli taking that splinter out of your hand, and he said yes. So I told him I wanted to show it to you, and could I please have it back, and he said no. Drake stopped talking, but I just stared at him. And that's all you said? No. I asked him if he was serious or joking, and he assured me he wanted to keep it and had no plans to give it back. He took the picture out of his back pocket along with a wad of cash. I thought he was going to hand me the picture but he handed me a hundred dollar bill instead. He said I could buy more photo paper with that and make a new one. My eyes got wide. What did you say? Drake shrugged. I took the cash, he said. His hand had been balled up in a fist, but he opened it, revealing the hundred dollar bill on the inside. Did Joe give you a hundred dollars for that picture? Emily asked, leaning forward to talk to Drake. He opened his hand to show her the bill as he nodded. Why? she asked with a confused expression. Drake shrugged and shook his head before looking at me. I have no clue, he said, staring straight at me like I knew something and wasn't admitting it. He said if you wanted to see it, you could come ask him yourself. I blinked at him. He said that? Drake nodded and showed me the money again before putting it in his pocket. I guess it's his now, so he doesn't have to give it to me if he doesn't want to. What if I buy it for two? I asked. Two hundred? Drake asked, looking at me like I was crazy. One fifty, I said. You don't have one fifty, he said. I squinted at him. Yes, I do. I have one fifty on me. Not to spend on a little picture worth seventy-two cents. I'll just print you another one. I started digging in my bag for a piece of sketch paper. My preferred medium was charcoal on paper, but I could work with pencil or pen, and I always carried a few travel supplies around with me. I made a quick sketch of an auction scene with a girl yelling, $150 in a word bubble. I drew the auctioneer's bubble saying, we have a winner. I made a caption at the bottom that said, 
Thank you for your bid, but I am giving Drake $150 for the photo. Here you will find your full refund. Please pass the photo back to 26B. It took me about 30 minutes to illustrate and do the lettering, but I was pleased with the outcome. It was cute, and I smiled down at it as I read over it one last time. I'm not giving that refund, Drake said, looking at it as I held it out for inspection. He had been dozing off while I worked on it, but he woke up and stirred right when I finished. I'm seriously going to give you the 150, I said. Drake shook his head. That's a rad drawing and all, but I'm not letting you give me $150 of your money for that little picture. And I'm not giving Joe's money back. God knows he doesn't need it. I shrugged. You don't have to give anything back, I said. I'm sending a hundred bucks of my own. I already planned on doing that. I folded the paper strategically, enclosing the hundred dollar bill I had already dug out of my purse. I was so glad I happened to have that on me. You're not giving that to him. Drake said, I'm not letting you. I'll just go ask for the picture back. You can't without giving him his money back, I said. Drake looked deflated when that thought occurred to him. Oh, yeah, he said. It's fine. I didn't pay for anything in Ireland. Plus, I think it's fun to send a note on an airplane. The entertainment alone is worth the money. I had already written, please deliver to the man in 19F on the outside of the paper, and I held it up that instant because I knew a flight attendant was walking by. She scooped it up, reading it as she continued to walk. I watched as she glanced back at me with a wink before turning to deliver the note to Joe. I can't believe you just did that, Drake said, peering over the seats to watch her. You need to go get that back. Just let me try to make him give me the picture, I said, since I really did want to see it. We watched for a minute, but we couldn't see anything. So Drake relaxed in his chair, and so did I. There was a movie playing on the back of each headrest, and we spaced out, staring straight ahead. I figured Emily would tell me if she saw any action down the aisle. Drake had drifted back to sleep, and I was absentmindedly watching the movie when the flight attendant came up to me, carrying a homemade paper pouch that had been fashioned with a few sheets from the Sky Mall magazine. She handed it to me, and I stared at her in confusion when I realized what it was made from. She smiled and shrugged obviously not worried about the vandalism, since the man who handed it to her was most likely Joe, and could therefore charm his way out of anything. She walked away, and I opened the pouch, fully expecting to find the photograph when I looked inside. Shut the front door, Emily whispered when I opened the paper to find multiple hundred-dollar bills. There was also a small piece of paper, but there was neither the photograph nor the drawing I had sent his way. Nuh-uh. How much money is that? Drake asked. What's the note say? Emily asked. They both leaned in, trying to get a better look. Before counting the money, I turned over the paper. There was a handwritten note that had been written on a pad from Eli's medical office. Here's Drake's money back, plus a hundred more for him. That makes two hundred for the picture. Sorry, but I outbid you. Also, I am keeping that drawing, so that's what the rest of the money is about. I looked down and thumbed through the bills, realizing there were three $100 bills stacked on top of each other in a neatly folded stack. I glanced at Drake, and the two of us locked eyes for a second. He's not giving us all this, I said. It looks like he is, he said. He reached out and pointed at the bottom of the note, which said, And please don't try to outbid me again. I'm keeping this picture. I sat there with the note and the money in my hand for at least two minutes while Drake and Emily talked about how outlandish the whole thing was. I had never been in a situation like this one and wasn't quite sure how to handle it. I knew we couldn't keep the money. Several minutes had passed when Joe got out of his seat and began walking toward the back of the plane. He glanced my way once he got closer to our row, and I made eye contact with him for a split second before glancing away. I stared at the seat back for a few seconds before I looked at him again. His gaze was still aimed at me. His expression was completely unreadable as he walked past my row, glancing at my lap, which still contained the open envelope with the note and the money. Emily, Drake, and I were all quiet until Joe had already taken a few steps past us. He was looking at you, Emily said. 
I turned to get a peek at Joe from over my shoulder without commenting on her observation. I'm going to go give this back to him, I said. Not the hundred that's yours, Drake said, reminding me as I stood up to follow Joe to the back of the plane. I held on to the money, note, and magazine pages as I headed down the aisle. Apparently, the restroom was occupied because Joe stopped in front of the door before stepping back to lean against the opposite wall. He caught sight of me when he turned, and he shot me a surprised smile. Hey, I said. Hey, yourself. I held out the money. I wanted to come bring you this, I said, handing him the full 300 without reimbursing myself. I wasn't even certain whose was what or what was whose by that point. I don't want it, he said, pushing my hand away by my wrist. I want the picture and the drawing. Someone came out of the restroom at that moment, and we shifted so that she could make her way past us. Can I see it at least? He gave me a coy smile. I don't know why you want it so bad. He reached into his back pocket and came up with the small photograph, holding it in front of me. I took it from him, staring down at the shot of us all gathered around the table with Eli working on my hand. Joe was clearly holding me. His posture looked protective, and his expression was full of sweet concern. My eyes came up to meet his after several seconds of staring at it. I don't know why you want this, I said, repeating his words back to him. He reached out and snatched it from me. Because I do, he said, putting it back into his pocket. I tried once more to give him the money, but again he pushed my hand away. I know you weren't trying to hear anything about this last night when I brought it up, but you should know I talked to Chelsea. I put my hand in the air, closing my eyes. You really didn't need to, I interrupted, feeling already sick at the sound of her name. I ended things, Lou. I stood there feeling speechless, and he gave me a patient half-smile. I'm not assuming things are going to turn out one way or another with us, Lou, but I did end things with her. That was just something I needed to do. I was trying to think of the right thing to say when the flight attendant walked by and informed us that the restroom was unoccupied. I don't want this, I whispered, offering Joe the wad of paper once again. Too bad, he said, avoiding my hand and then pushing it back toward me as he stepped into the restroom. He smiled at me before he closed the door, and rather than stand there and wait for a restroom I didn't need to use, I walked numbly to my seat. Chapter 10 What happened? Drake asked when I got back to my seat. Nothing, I replied. Nothing? Did you talk to him? I nodded. Did you get the picture? I shook my head. Did you give him the money back? I shook my head as I opened the magazine pages, revealing the cash. So what did he say? Did he let you look at it? I nodded, feeling shaken at the memory of the picture. I'll just print another one, Drake said. I think it's funny, Emily said. I wonder why he wanted it. Because he likes Lou, Drake said. He does not, I said, whispering just so they would be quiet. He might, if he just gave you $300 for that picture, Emily added in disbelief. Technically, it was two for the picture and one for the drawing. Drake said. His statement made me hand him one of the hundreds, but he pushed my hand away, regarding me like he thought I might be crazy. I don't want it, he said. I was just reminding Emily that he bought your drawing, too, technically. I knew that. I'm just saying, I can't believe he gave y'all 300, period. I attempted again to hand Drake one of the bills, but he made a face at me that said he wasn't going to take it no matter how many times I tried. I knew the impassive expression for what it was so I slipped the folded bills into my pocket. I only had it put away for a few seconds before I took it out again. I peeled one of the bills from the outside of the stack and extended it to Drake. Seriously, he said, looking at me. No, it's for the pictures. I dropped the cash on his leg and grabbed the stack of photographs that were wedged between his leg and the seat. Is it a fair deal for me to take these, or do you need more money than that? He stared at me in utter confusion. Those haven't even been edited, he said. I just printed them out so we would have something to look at on the plane. I wasn't even planning on hanging on to them. 
So you won't mind if I take them? I asked. He shrugged. No. I mean, I still have a lot of edits to do on some of these, so don't go posting them or passing them out or anything. I smiled. I won't, I promise. I happened to have a ponytail holder around my wrist, and I placed it around the stack of pictures before stashing them in my bag. The remainder of the flight went quickly. Emily asked me a bunch of questions about my art and going to live at SNS. She asked me if the documentary was something I wanted to do, which, surprisingly, no one had ever asked before. Everyone just assumed I was thrilled. The producers would only be following a select few, and it was a miracle that I was the new person at SNS at exactly the right time. It would mean tremendous exposure, which was, in the long run, what I wanted. So, yes, I was extremely thankful for the opportunity, and I knew it would benefit me. But that wasn't her question. Her question was whether or not the documentary was something I wanted to do. And the answer to that, in my heart at least, was no. The fact of the matter was that I was scared to death at the prospect of doing it, mortified. I felt like I might choke under the pressure and not be able to make art anymore. I remembered what Mr. Steiner was saying to me about winging it, and it was with a smile on my face that I told Emily how much I was looking forward to doing the documentary. There's a difference between lying to yourself and simply denying certain unhealthy feelings, and I hoped I was managing the latter. Drake slept for the rest of the trip, but I had a fine time talking with Emily, and just like that, the flight was over. Landing and baggage claim happened so quickly that before I knew it, I was in a cab on my way home from the airport. The Spicers had offered to have their driver take me to my place after he dropped them and Eli and Rebecca off, but since I knew it would take forever, I opted to take a cab. Joe had his own ride and left before the rest of us since he didn't have any checked baggage. He came up behind me at baggage claim and casually offered to wait for me if I wanted a ride, but I could tell he was in a little bit of a hurry and just being nice. So I told him I already had plans to share a cab. I mentioned giving his money back, but he refused again, saying he'd be in touch. He had a lot going on with his family trying to talk to him and say goodbye, so I just stayed out of the way. It was 6 p.m. New York time by the time I made it to Sarah's apartment and plopped onto the couch. I had left Ireland just before 2 p.m. that day, and with the time change and everything, I made it all the way back home by 6. I propped my feet onto the coffee table, feeling spent when I first came in the door. But there were some things I needed to do before I could fully relax, so I didn't stay there long. I completely unpacked before taking a long shower where I washed my hair and shaved my legs. Traveling seemed to leave a layer of some unknown, unseen substance on me, and it always felt great to wash it off. I was at home in Sarah's apartment, a beautiful one-bedroom with a well-lit nook that she used as a studio. We both kept our art supplies in there, so it was wall-to-wall -wall with paper and clay. Sarah was a potter, so her stuff took up a lot more room than mine did. But I had my own little corner of the room, and I was really grateful for her generosity. I lived in the dorms while I was in college, but I had been staying with Sarah since graduation, and she had never once complained or asked me for anything. As much as I was excited to get the spot at S&S, and as nice a place as it was, it would definitely be a downgrade in living conditions for me. Sarah's apartment was swank, and I knew how fortunate I had been to live there as long as I had. Sarah would be in Ireland for the next week, so I would have the place all to myself. I smiled and sighed as I plopped onto the oversized sofa that I called home. Sarah told me I could use her bed while she was out of town, but I wouldn't take her up on it. I was comfortable on the couch anyway. I stayed on it for the remainder of the evening, only getting up to pay the delivery guy for my Chinese takeout and use the restroom when necessary. I was so glad I had the foresight to buy those wedding pictures from Drake. I looked at them what must have been ten times that night, spreading them out around me and on the coffee table at one point so I could look down and see them all at once. I even pulled out the thorn in its little baggie and placed it on the coffee table so I could have all my Ireland memories right there in front of me. I wished I had that picture from the pub, but I loved that Joe wanted it so I was happier with it where it was. There were still a few pictures scattered about when I fell asleep, but I had picked most of them up and stashed them in a pile on the coffee table. There were several good ones of Joe in the bunch, 
but I purposefully had those on the bottom. I knew if I just sat there and stared at them, I would only sink deeper into my infatuation with him. Boy, was it a good thing those photos were on the bottom of that pile, because the next morning, before I even had the chance to open my eyes, none other than Joe himself came walking in the door. He must have just unlocked it and let himself in, because one second I was sleeping and the next I was staring at Joe's face. I blinked in confusion, and he smiled at me, only it took me a second to realize who he was, where we were, and why he was smiling. Actually, I had no idea why he was smiling. What happened? I asked, sitting up when I realized I wasn't dreaming. Joe Spicer was standing there, staring down at me. What's wrong? I asked. He smiled and crossed to the kitchen. Nothing, he said, other than the fact that you sleep like a rock. He took out the orange juice and poured two glasses. I watched him doing it, but it still all seemed like a dream. I groggily adjusted to sit cross-legged, leaning against the back of the couch. What are you doing here? I asked as he headed back toward me, holding the juice. What are you doing here? He asked. I live here, I said. You do? He asked, looking genuinely surprised, which I knew was an act. I grimaced at him. It's too early, I said. He handed me the small glass of juice, which I took gratefully. I took a sip of the cold, sweet liquid before leaning over to look at the time on the cable box. 8.46. I can't stay, he said. What are you doing? I asked. He came to sit on the couch next to me, although he was on the edge of it. I came by to check on my sister's place while she's out of town, he said. Oh, you did? Because I live here, I said. I'm pretty much checking on it all the time. Huh, he said, like he thought that was interesting. He finished the last half of his drink in one swig and set the glass on a magazine that was sitting on the coffee table. Looks like you ended up with the rest of the pictures, he said as he glanced at them. Drake brought them over, I said, implying that Drake had been there. I looked around the couch and then over my shoulder toward the bathroom. He must be up already, I added. Joe got to his feet, facing the bathroom in an alert stance that made me laugh. I threw a small pillow at him as I giggled, and Joe put it together that I had only been kidding about Drake spending the night, or having been there at all. Is he? Does he spend the night here? No, I said, laughing. We're just friends. I didn't think you'd take me seriously. I didn't, Joe said, even though he totally had. I bit my lip to keep from smiling as he sat on the edge of the couch again. He stared at the ground beneath his feet for a second before looking at me. Again, I was struck by the ringed pattern of his eyes. I know you live here, he said. You do? Yep, he said. But I didn't know you'd be on the couch when I came in. I did try to knock first. I sleep really heavy. I see that. It took me a few tries to wake you up. I took the last sip of my orange juice. I set the empty glass on the table, pausing the white noise that was coming from my phone, the one that sounded like a thunderstorm mixed with a box fan. Plus I use this thing, I added. I was wondering what that sound was. He gave my phone a quick, curious glance before focusing on me again. Are you up? What do you mean, up? Awake. Do you feel awake? Why? Because I really do have to leave. I'm running late and I need to go. Chapter 11 I stared at Joe, wondering why in the world he had come over to wake me up only to inform me that he had to rush off. Why'd you wake me up only to tell me you're in a hurry? I asked. He leaned forward resting his forehead on his fingertips before shifting to look at me. I have that picture from the pub, he said. I know. I was looking at it. You were? Yep. And what? I asked. And it makes me mad at myself for not kissing you while we were there. I pulled back to stare at him since that was the absolute last thing I expected him to say. You did the right thing by not doing that, I said. You can't do that when you're talking to another girl. 
It made me cringe while at the same time gave me some sense of power to mention the other girl. Well, I took care of that situation. And now I'm here to remedy the whole not kissing you thing. My heart was about to beat out of my chest. I wanted to kiss him more than anything in the world. I had imagined it countless times. But for whatever reason, I felt like being a little stubborn about it. Well, too bad, because I'm not doing that right now, I said, crossing my arms. He pulled back, regarding me with his fist over his smiling mouth. He was the epitome of handsomeness, and I shook my head at the fact that I was right in the middle of turning him down, that I was even attempting to do it. Don't smile at me like that, Joseph. You can't come over here and wake me up with a glass of orange juice and just expect that I'll want to jump right into kissing you before you run off to... I paused to look him over, noticing his athletic clothes and shoes. The gym or wherever you're going. I'm going to play basketball. And yes, Lou, I did think I would come over here and jump right into kissing you. The way I imagined it, you would want me to. I stared at him for a couple of seconds before giving him a narrow-eyed smile. I do want you to, but I'm still not going to let you. He leaned a little closer to me, staring at me in the same way he did at the pub. Why not? He asked. Because I just woke up and I look terrible, I said. I'm not prepared to try to be impressive right now. He stretched a little closer, inspecting my face with adorable innocence as if he was truly noticing me for the first time. I giggled under his scrutiny. Lou, you are absolutely beautiful right now. He sat up, taking in my little area on the couch. He sighed and shot me a sweet, reluctant smile. I really have to go, he said, slapping a hand to his knee. He stood up and leaned in to hug me, turning his face away as a means of assuring me he wasn't going to kiss me. I'm sorry I woke you up, he said, with that noncommittal contact. I reached up to hug him back, wrapping my arms around his neck. He tried to let go of me after only a quick squeeze, but I held him there. I'm sorry I said no when you asked me. I whispered since his ear was fairly close to my mouth. One of his hands came out, resting on the back of the couch so he could brace his weight. Sorry you said no to what? He asked, staring down at me. I looked away shyly. To why you came over here? He was quiet until I looked at him again, and when I did, I saw that he was regarding me with a patient half-smile. What are you saying, Lou? You know, I said. He smiled. What? My eyes widened and his smile grew. Are you giving me permission to kiss you right now? He put his lips so close to mine as he whispered that he was practically kissing me already. His mouth touched mine when he spoke, leaving me breathless by the time he asked his question. Wait, what was his question? What? You heard me, he whispered, still torturing me with his closeness. I actually didn't. I already know the answer to my question anyway, he said, holding his perfect mouth torturously close to mine. What was your question? I asked. It was something about... He hesitated, letting his lips linger only millimeters from mine. Finally, and with devastating carefulness, he let our lips connect. He did it again, this time drawing my upper lip into his mouth just a little. I can't remember, he whispered, finishing his statement as he broke away. I couldn't stand it. I tugged at him with my grip around his neck and stretched up, forcing our lips to touch again. This time, I pulled his lip into mine, causing him to slowly smile. What? I asked, lips still almost touching. You, he said. What about me? You're kissing me. I squinted at him. You're kissing me too. Yes, I sure am but you're kissing me back. Well, you're the one who came over here. He smiled. You're right, and I need to go. I'm gonna be late. For your basketball game? 
Yep, for my basketball game. I can't believe you know enough guys to make a whole game at 9 a.m. in the middle of the week. I really didn't care about the basketball game. I just wanted to keep whispering to him. He pinched my side gently. I can't believe you're making me late, he said. I smiled. I'm not. You're free to go whenever you like. I said the words, but I kept my arms wrapped around his neck like I wasn't letting him go anywhere. I'm glad I came over here, he said, still whispering. Me too. But you have to go, so bye, I said. I gave him one last quick kiss on the mouth and let go of my grip around his neck, patting him on the shoulder as I looked away. I hope you play good, I said as a farewell. He stood up, pulling me up with him. I thought you might want to come with me to a thing I have this weekend. What is it? I asked. Some charity thing. You'll have to wear a dress. He stopped when we came to stand near the door, turning to face me. No, I said. Just like that? Refusal, rejection? I smiled. I don't know anything about those things, and I don't have anything to wear. Just look in Sarah's closet. I'm sure she has something. Girls don't all wear the same size, you know. He let his eye roam over me. You have to be close, though, huh? That's not the point. It's that I don't go to those things. You better get some culture and charity in your life if you're about to get famous in some documentary and sell your art for boatloads of money. I smiled, even though that type of statement came with self-inflicted pressure. I need to show up with a date. And you kind of owe it to me, since I'd have a date if it weren't for you. I stared at him, knowing exactly what he was getting at, and feeling breathless because of it. I didn't have enough confidence for any of this, not for making and selling art, or going on a documentary, and certainly not for going to fancy charity functions with Joe Spicer. I turned him by the shoulders before reaching down to open the door, literally pushing him out in a sweet, playful way. Just text me later if that still feels like something you want to do. It is something I want, he said. That's why I'm asking you. He let me push him out since he knew he had to leave. So please locate a dress, something formal. Just text my mom and ask her what you should wear. She'll help you. She's the one who has me going to it in the first place. If she can't come up with something for you to wear, I'll buy you something. He was already a foot or two out the door, but he ducked back inside to place another kiss on my cheek. I grabbed him by the shirt and held him close, causing him to leave his mouth on my cheek for a few extra seconds. So yes? He asked. It's Friday night. Yes. Good. Hopefully I'll see you before then. I'll call you later. He smiled and waved at me as he made his way down the hall toward the elevator. I closed the door behind me, resting against it in a swimmy state as I pictured the way Joe leaned over me on the couch with his lips brushing against mine the way he looked at me when he said I was the reason he didn't have a date. I scrunched up my face and buried it in my hands, unable to process or believe this unbelievable wake-up call. I tried to relive the whole scene, but it was so unexpected that it all seemed hazy in my memory. I had some social media responses to take care of that morning, so I tended to that instead of letting myself obsess over whether or not I should call Mrs. Spicer to follow up about searching for a dress. I decided to put off contacting her because I honestly believed I might have dreamed the whole encounter with Joe. If there hadn't been two dirty orange juice glasses, I would have leaned more toward feeling like it had been a dream. It certainly was an encounter I would make up in a daydream, so I wouldn't put it past myself to dream it on purpose or see it as a vision. Joe had been at the apartment, though. He had kissed me, and I had kissed him, and then he asked me to a ball, and I agreed to go. It was later that afternoon when I got more information about it, and that was in the form of an email from Sarah. Greetings from the land of leprechauns. Colin has a little work to do, so I thought I would check my email. Drake sent me some of the photos from the wedding. It seems you ended up at a pub with your face buried in my brother's chest. I would tease you about some undiscovered spark that happened between you two, but it seems you already know about it. Joe sent me a message saying you might want to borrow a dress for the spring gala this weekend. I was actually supposed to go to that. 
We go every year, and I always have a good time. It's the one where I wore that white dress last year. You helped me do my hair, and you said you loved that dress. I think it's at my mom's. Just text her if you want to try it on. There may be a dress or two in my closet, but my mom's got a lot. Please help yourself to anything I own. Also, I'm relatively sure you kissed my brother in the pantry the other day, which is an ideal scenario for me since I love you both. Please know how thrilled I am about you two. I'm so happy you came to my wedding. Thank you for being here. Love and hugs from Ireland, Mrs. Sarah Ross. I smiled as I read her email, but it quickly faded when I had to tell Sarah it wasn't her brother I had been kissing. I had to address it while I was thinking about it, because I didn't want her to accidentally tease me about it in front of Joe. Dearest Sarah, Please tell me you feel like a princess over there in your real-life castle. The wedding was a beautiful experience, and I am so glad I got to be with you. Joe and I didn't run into each other in the pantry, just so you know. He came across me when I had just gotten that splinter stuck in my hand, so he saw me through the process of getting it out. He came by your apartment this morning and mentioned something about me going to that event. If I decide to go, I'll hit your mom up about that dress. Thank you for taking care of me from across the ocean, and may the rest of your trip be as beautiful as the beginning. I love you, and I'm so happy you found Colin. Much love from New York. Your favorite nerd, Luli Osborne. I had this whole paragraph written where I said I knew she'd be moving in with Colin when they got back to the city how I knew I had to find another place to live for the next few months, and I was working on it. But I decided to take that part out so I didn't bother her with those details on her honeymoon. It was already bad enough that she was emailing me about a dress. Chapter 12 The next few days passed in a flash. Quite a few of my prints were for sale on the internet, and I had to take care of some recent orders during the times when I wasn't working at the coffee shop. Also, the apartment needed my attention, so there was daily cleaning that had to happen. And then again, maybe all of my scurrying around was the result of nervous energy, all for a moment that was now here. It was Friday evening, and I was all dressed for a formal event with the Spicers. Two of my friends, Macy and Mia, had been there with me while I was getting dressed, but Joe and the others were on the way, so the girls had just left. I had obviously hung out with the Spicers before, but never without Sarah, and never ever at an event like this. I hadn't been to anything formal since my high school prom. To say I was intimidated would be a severe understatement. I was shaking in my boots, scared stiff. I literally felt stiff as I stared at myself in the full-length mirror in Sarah's closet. I had gone to see Rhonda Spicer to try on Sarah's dress, and I ended up choosing one of Rebecca's from a few years ago. This worked out since Rebecca and I wore the same size shoe, and I could just borrow the ones she had worn with the dress. It was a goldish brown number with a vintage feel. It was better than anything I would have picked out at a store, so I was thankful that Rhonda was a bit of a dress hoarder and still had it on hand. She assured me that it was perfect for the event, and Macy and Mia had just told me I looked great, but I was full of nerves and emotions nonetheless. I was staring at myself dazedly when my phone rang, causing me to jump. It was inside the small clutch I was holding, and I fished around in there until I came up with it. It was Joe, and I pressed the button to connect as I held the phone to my ear. Hello? Are you ready? He asked. I smiled, as I'll ever be, I said. I'm coming up to get you, he said. I can come down. I'm already on the elevator, he said. I looked around in a hurry, but realized I was already ready, and that was why I had been standing there looking at the finished result. I'm on your floor, he said. I beamed at the giddy feeling that came over me on my way to meet him. I had talked to him several times, but I hadn't seen him since the other morning when he came by on his way to the gym. I walked across the living room, feeling short of breath. I made it to the door before Joe knocked, and I stood there, feeling all stirred up inside. Are you there? He asked. I knew he must be close to the door, but I heard him say the words too loudly, considering the fact that I couldn't see him. It was then that I realized I still had the phone to my ear. 
Oh my gosh, are you there? I asked, trying desperately to regulate my breathing. I'm here, he said. His voice was in my ear, but I knew he was also telling me that he was standing on the other side of the door. I'm really nervous, I said. Oh yeah? He asked. Not only could I hear his voice in my ear, but now I could also hear him in the hallway. I knew now beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was standing on the other side of that door. I don't know why I agreed to this, I said, making no move to open the door. Because you want to hang out with me, he said. He was a hundred percent right. Otherwise, I never would have gotten myself into something like this. I mean, there were spanks and sequins involved in this outfit, for goodness sake. I still had the phone to my ear with one hand while I used my other hand to reach out and slowly turn the knob. I don't remember what you look like, I said before we could see each other. I was nervous, so I opened it slowly. Open the door and find out, he said. We both had our phones to our ears when I finally opened the door fully. Joe was sharply dressed in a glorious fitted suit. He had the style sensibility of Justin Timberlake with the body of a pro athlete, and I found it difficult to look at him at all without experiencing waves of attraction and anticipation. Why do you have to be so beautiful? I heard him ask. Our phones were still at our ears, and I smiled at the sound of his deep voice coming from two different directions. Oh my gosh, Joe. You know how to dress, I said shaking my head at how utterly handsome he was. You, my dear girl, look like something I'd find in a treasure chest. You look like all the riches in the world. He stepped forward with a confident, easy smile, and I found it difficult to breathe. He came close enough to put his hand on my lower back and draw me toward him. You ready? He asked. Yep, I said, trying to sound more sure of myself than I was. There was a limo waiting for us when we got downstairs, and I smiled at Joe when I saw it. Mom and Dad are in there, he said. We've still got to pick up Eli and Rebecca. The driver held the door open, and I climbed inside, smiling at Saul and Rhonda on my way across the back seat. You look wonderful, Rhonda said, once I had settled in my seat enough to hear her. Joe climbed in after me, taking a seat at my left and leaving us both facing his parents. He settled into his seat in such a way that his knee barely brushed my thigh, and I glanced at him before smiling at his parents. Thank you, I said to his mom for the compliment. I'm so glad I could borrow the dress. It looks nice on you, Lubug, Saul said. He was a man of few words, but he had a soft spot for me and could probably tell I was nervous. I smiled at his sweetness and thanked him, telling him how his wife and Rebecca fixed me up with everything I had on. One of Joe's good friends was a guy named Ethan Prescott. He was also one of the biggest name actors on Saul's show. Ethan had starred in a few box office hits before coming to work on the set of Bad Medicine with Saul five years before. Ethan loved New York and felt like family with everyone on set, so he had basically hung up his Hollywood hat and had settled into the life of a television star. Apparently, Ethan was planning on coming to the event tonight, and those of us riding in the limo had a conversation about him and who he may or may not be bringing as a date. I had met him once with Sarah, but I definitely wasn't used to being around famous people all the time the way the Spicers were. I don't know how many times I silently whispered the words, wing it, to myself. Said it so many times I almost lost its meaning, and I started thinking of things like angel wings and bird wings and even buffalo chicken wings. I was spacing out on telling myself to wing it when I felt Joe nudge me. It's August, right? Joe asked. I glanced at his parents and knew from their expression that everyone was waiting for me to answer. August, yes, I said without really even knowing what they were saying. Are you asking about SNS? Saul nodded. Yes, sir, I said. I move in August 12th. Saul and Rhonda were both smiling at me, but I instantly felt like I should make some sort of explanation, since I was staying at Sarah's place. I know Sarah's married now, I said. I'm going to be staying somewhere else between now and August. I have it worked out. I hadn't even thought about that, sweetheart, Rhonda said with a sweet smile. Where are you staying? Joe asked. I looked at him, 
and because I hadn't expected to be having this conversation, and I didn't have anything better to say, I stated the truth. Drake, I said. Joe's face fell, and he looked at me with an expression that said, You must be kidding me. I heard Sarah and Colin talking about her moving into his place when they come back from their honeymoon, Rhonda said, in which case I'm sure she'd be happy to let you hold on to that apartment if it's just till August. She looked at her husband, who nodded, since he would, to some extent, wind up being out of pocket in some way on the deal. I knew she was offering to help me, and I smiled at how generous they were. You guys are the nicest people ever, but I'm good. I've already talked to Drake about it. He said he's looking forward to having me around so I can clean the place. Drake had actually said that to me, but he was totally joking when he said it. That's just not happening, Joe said. I glanced at him to find that he was shaking his head impassively, which made me smile. What's not happening? Sue had asked Rhonda a question, and the two of them had become preoccupied discussing something on the other side of the limo. You don't need to move in over there, Joe said. Seriously, what made you think of staying there? He seemed like he really wanted me to answer the question. I took a quick glance in his parents' direction before I said, Drake and I have been good friends for a long time. He's got the extra room, and he doesn't mind me staying. It's only till August. Doesn't he have a girlfriend? Joe asked with a confused expression. I smiled and nodded. Yes, I said. Well, no, Joe said, speaking quietly enough that his parents wouldn't pay attention to us. Just, no, you can't just move into some guy's house. He's my friend, I said. It's no big deal. He's doing me a favor. Joe stared at me like he was thinking about it and trying to be open-minded, but ultimately he shook his head. What? I asked. I don't see why you need to move out of Sarah's place, Joe said. You heard them say she's moving in with Colin when they get back. You should just stay in the apartment. Just as he finished his statement, the car came to a stop in front of Eli and Rebecca's building. His parents were now looking directly at us, so we discontinued our conversation. But we regarded each other like we wanted to say something more. Eli and Rebecca lived only blocks from Ethan. And after we picked them up, we made a stop at Ethan's apartment. Ethan knew he was going to the event, but he had only decided to ride with us at the last minute when Joe texted him from the limo. The A-list television star had a petite young woman with him who identified herself as Gabriella. She was soft-spoken, but Rhonda asked her a few questions, and she told us about being a dancer and studying at Juilliard. I knew a few people in that program, and Gabriella and I figured out that we had a couple common acquaintances. There were so many of us, and the conversation was so constant that there was no more talk of me staying at Drake's until August. Anyway, I had only brought it up because I didn't want the Spicers to think I thought I could stay at Sarah's place now that she was moving out. I was glad the conversation wasn't centered on me anymore, because it was hard for me to even think straight with Joe sitting by my side and the gigantic television star sitting right next to us. All of them were successful and intimidating in their own right. Every single person in this limo. I smiled and straightened my shoulders as I pictured one of those shoes with a wing on it, which was, as far as I knew, the emblem of track and field. Since my conversation with Mr. Steiner, I would use any wing-type visual to serve as a reminder that no one else in life had it all figured out either. Chapter 13 I didn't know how to pronounce the word gala, I had heard it multiple times in my life, but I had a mental block in regards to what that first A was supposed to sound like, so I just used other words to describe the place we were going that evening, even though it was a gala. It said so right on the beautiful banner. Being surrounded by all of these people in black tie attire made me experience a sense of importance, like I'd somehow advanced to a new level of adulthood simply by stepping foot in the door. Photographers behind velvet ropes snapped pictures of us as we walked up. I knew it was for Ethan and perhaps Saul, but they snapped pictures of all of us. There was a wall covered with watermarks of the name of the gala plastered all over it. And I realized when our group paused in front of it that it was a photo backdrop. 
Joe pulled me close enough that he could mumble into my ear. Just stand right here for a second looking happy. They're going to take a bunch of pictures of Ethan. In a few seconds, I'm going to turn you around and they're going to snap a few of you and me before we walk in. Just smile and act happy. That's easy because I am happy, I tried to say. But just as I said it, he turned me by the waist to face the six or eight men with cameras standing at the entrance. I smiled and I tried to look natural while at the same time standing up straight and sucking in. Thankfully, in no time, Joe nodded at the cameras and nudged me along. We found our way to the hallway that led toward the ballroom. There were a couple of security checkpoints along the way, but the workers just nodded us along. We signed in at the entrance of the ballroom. A hostess showed us to our table and informed us that dinner would be served in an hour and that dancing was encouraged before and after. There would be items up for auction at various times throughout the night, and we were to bid simply by raising the little paddles that were part of the centerpieces on each table. She pointed out the restrooms, the dance floor, and the items up for auction, which were displayed against the far wall. The tables each sat six, so Joe and I were sitting with Eli, Rebecca, Ethan, and Gabriella. Saul and Rhonda were at an adjacent table with some of their friends. I want you to meet Michael, Ethan said to Joe before we even sat down at the table. It didn't surprise me that he wanted to walk around, since that seemed to be the vibe at this event. You two go ahead, Eli said, even though nobody had asked him anything. Rebecca's going to have me over there shopping. They always have good stuff, she said. She smiled at Gabriella and me. You two should come over there with us. Joe glanced at me with an expression that said he wouldn't go with Ethan if I wasn't comfortable with it. I smiled and shook my head at him. I'll hang with the girls, I said. Ethan was apparently used to getting what he wanted and had no doubt that Joe was coming with him because he was tugging at him the whole time Joe and I looked at each other. It was surreal watching Joe watch me reluctantly as Ethan Prescott dragged him away. I had another surreal moment about 15 minutes later when I caught sight of Joe again. He was standing with Ethan, talking to a group of people near the back of the ballroom. Even from a distance and right next to Ethan Prescott, Joe took my breath away. I always knew what a presence he was, and it was obvious even from across the room. That's why Ethan wanted to drag him along. Joe was just magnetic like that. He smiled at something someone in the group was saying, and I smiled right along with him. Lulu Lemon, I heard a guy's voice say from behind me. I knew who it was before I even turned around. Chris Higgins was in art school with me my first two years. He had gotten into some trouble, and his attendance got worse and worse until he finally dropped out altogether. Chris was the only person who ever called me Lulu Lemon, and he called me that and nothing else. I wasn't even sure if he knew my name was just Lou. I turned to find Chris wearing a white shirt and black slacks, which didn't surprise me since I knew he frequently worked catering gigs. He was a handsome guy. He had long hair that he wore down when he was at school, but now he had it pulled back into a ponytail. He looked me over with an appraising stare and reached out for a hug. What are you doing here, you little hottie? I'm here with Sarah's family, I said. I knew Chris knew Sarah so I thought that would explain everything. I gestured at Rebecca and Eli, who were a few feet away, but he barely spared them a glance. What are you doing now? He asked, looking at me with a sincere, extremely interested expression. Just the way he smiled at me made me feel like I was somehow betraying Joe. I got a spot at SNS, I said. No kidding, he said with wide eyes. That's close to where I work. I'll have to come check you out sometime. Is Macy still over there? I nodded. Are you still painting? I asked. You know I am, he said. People like us, we're destined to make art. It's like it's in our DNA, you know? I was deciding how I wanted to respond when a movement caught my eye from over Chris's shoulder. I glanced in that direction to find that Joe was only a couple of feet from us. He walked right up next to me, pulling me into his protective boundaries. He put a quick kiss on my cheek before turning to greet Chris. I'm Joe, he said with his hand extended. Chris shook it. Chris! Chris and I know each other from Columbia, I said. I looked at Chris. Joe's Sarah's brother. Ah, he said. The doctor? No. The app guy, then? 
Joe gave him a nod and a cordial smile. The app guy. It was nice to meet you, Chris said, picking up an empty glass from a nearby table. And great to see you, Lululemon pretty women. It wasn't uncommon for Chris to add something to the already ridiculous nickname, so I just smiled and waved at him as he walked away. I shifted so I could focus on Joe. I can't leave you alone for five minutes, he said with an easy smile that had my stomach in knots. That was not five minutes, I said. Either way, I had to come over here and fight Fabio off of you with a stick. You didn't have to, I said. You could have just let him stay over here. All he wanted to do was ask me out. Did he really? Joe asked, looking around. I giggled at the way he got protective, and he took me into his arms. The music was in the background from where we were standing, but he swayed with me in his arms, dancing to the beat. I saw you over there talking to Ethan and them, I said as we swayed. He's trying to make me start acting, he said. Really? He laughed. No, I'm kidding. No actor tries to talk another guy into becoming an actor. His friend Michael is a sports agent. They're talking about making a sports app. They need me for what I know about software design, so we're partnering up. You looked really handsome from where I was standing, I said. I bit my lip and pretended to be shy. I saw you over there across the room, making deals with big shots and so-and-sos. He put his hand on the small of my back. I saw you from across the room, too, he said, talking to some other no-good so-and-so. I would have talked to him a lot sooner if I would have known it would wind you up like this. He smiled. I'm sorry Ethan drug me off. I let out a little laugh. I was just messing with you about doing it sooner, I said. I don't mind hanging with Rebecca and Eli while you make deals and sign contracts and whatnot. He smiled at me with an adoring smile. I still have that picture, he said. You do? Uh-huh. It's on my dresser. I have it, too. On my phone, anyway. Drake texted it to me. Right then, Joe caught sight of someone he knew, and he paused to smile and wave at them. I did the same, even though I didn't know the man. He came over, and Joe introduced him as one of Saul's friends. I shook his hand, and we made small talk with him for a few minutes. He told me a story about Joe taking a boat without permission when he was a little boy, and it truly had me laughing. Joe and I danced a few songs and watched some items get auctioned off before dinner was served. After dinner, there was more dancing and entertainment, including some professional ballroom dancers and a magician. Joe and I talked with his family and the others around us, but we were virtually inseparable, and our conversation and attention, for most of the evening, was centered on each other. Ethan pulled him away for a few minutes near the end of the evening to talk to Michael again, but aside from that, Joe stuck beside me a fact for which I was extremely grateful. He was the life of the party, and being on his arm was fun and effortless. He let me speak for myself, but also stepped in to field certain questions or comments for me, and this left me feeling protected and cared for. It was the best night ever. You didn't buy anything, he said, once the last item was auctioned off. He was sitting on the edge of his chair, and I was standing next to him. We had just finished talking to a couple that had walked up to our table. Neither did you, I said. I didn't want anything. I smiled. Neither did I. What would you have bid on? Me? I asked. Probably the iPad. No, I mean if you could choose anything. Oh. You mean not just from the stuff they had here tonight? Yeah. Paper. Paper? I nodded. I'm a paper junkie. I love to draw on beautiful paper. I was thinking about it, he said. About paper? He smiled. No, not about paper. About what, then? About you staying at Sarah's place till August. What about it? You should do it. I smiled, and he scowled at me. I'm serious. I wish you would. I really don't care for you living with a guy. It's just Drake. I hate to say it like this, and I know it's just Drake, and you're just friends and everything. But I still don't want you to do it. Well, that's my best option, I said. Better than just staying at Sarah's? Moving into the bedroom, sprawling out, taking the place over? That's not an option. Yes, it is. 
It's the best option of all as far as I'm concerned. You know I can't take over her rent, Joe. I know, but I can. You're not doing that. I can't let you do something like that. That's just not even an option. He smiled. I assure you, Lou, it's a much better option than having you stay at that guy's house. I stared right into his eyes. It's just for a few months, I said. That's too long. He stood and pinched my elbow lightly to urge me toward the door with the rest of the family who was standing in a group. I glanced at them to find that they were looking at us like they were waiting. Where's Ethan? Saul asked as we approached. He left a little earlier, Joe said. So do we have everybody? Saul asked, looking around. Yep, Joe said. He came up behind me, holding me close to him right there in front of everybody. His mom shot us a look that said she was maybe a bit surprised by how affectionate her son was being with me. I couldn't say as I blamed her, because I was surprised by it, too. Chapter 14 That same limo was waiting for us when we stepped outside. Joe and I hung at the back of the pack while his parents and Eli and Rebecca climbed in. I was about to do the same, but Joe stepped in front of me leaning over to speak to his family from outside the open door. I'm not ready to take her home yet, he said. He glanced up the street and then at me. Are you up for a little walk? I smiled and nodded, since I would have done just about anything to avoid getting dropped off right then. He patted the top of the limo. You guys go ahead, he said. We'll take a cab home when we're ready. You sure? I heard his dad ask. Yep, I'll talk to you later. Love you. I heard the women yell back that they loved him, too, as he closed the door. Seconds later, I was standing on the sidewalk looking at Joe as the limo pulled away. It was fairly busy with other people leaving the event, so another car pulled into the spot right when the limo pulled away. Joe and I took off up the street. We were in Midtown, not far from Times Square, and we headed in that general direction. We walked for about an hour, talking about nothing and everything, and remarking on things and people we saw on the street. I had been around Joe, so I knew a bit about his persona. I knew he was smart and likable, but I didn't really know him yet. As we walked and talked, I discovered new, unexpected elements of his personality. I saw how compassionate and kind he was, even with strangers. As if I didn't have it bad enough for the guy, I now respected and admired his spirit. I was basically putty in his hands. We stopped at a traditional diner. An Elvis song was playing on the jukebox, and the checkerboard floors with chrome and red accents had me feeling like I had just stepped into the back seat of a 57 Chevy. Joe and I had been walking for a while, so my feet were aching. As we got settled in our booth, I kicked off my, Rebecca's, shoes, letting out a sigh of relief as I flexed my aching toes. I got so carried away with stretching my feet and legs that I accidentally touched Joe's leg under the table. He was in the middle of loosening his tie and stretching his neck by tilting his chin from side to side when I did it. He unbuttoned the top two buttons of his shirt, smiling at me. Are you playing footsie with me? He asked. I wanted to say something witty, but his smile left me with too little brain power. I was trying in vain to think of a good response about playing footsie when our waitress walked up. I was, no kidding, Thinking of the words saved by the bell about not having to say my rushed comeback when I turned and saw that the woman's name tag actually said bell. She smiled and introduced herself, placing menus in front of us, but I was so tickled by the name coincidence thing that it was all I could do to keep from cracking up. I was somewhat aware of Joe ordering us two cups of decaf before Bell took off with a smile. What's so funny? he asked after she walked away. I was thinking of that lady as Belle before I even read her name tag. It was just funny how it hit me when I saw that it was actually her name. Why were you thinking of her as Belle? He asked. I smiled. I knew you were going to ask me that when I told you. And the truth is that I was saying, saved by the Belle, in my head when she walked up. I giggled a little. The funny thing is, it was silly for me to even be thinking about being saved by the Belle in the first place. I was just thinking that because I was nervous. He gave me a slow, amused grin. Why are you nervous? You're the one playing footsie with me. All I did was point it out. 
A wave of anticipation hit me at the confidence he exuded, and I glanced away. Tell me what you really feel about SNS, he said. I smiled at him. I love it. I can't wait. I knew that's what you'd say, he said. I stared at him from across the table, waiting for him to finish. But what? I asked. But it's not what you mean, he said. I think I've spent enough time with you to call your bluff. She squinted playfully at him. Oh, so you think you have me all figured out? He smiled and raised his hand in surrender. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I'd like you to tell me what you really feel about going to live at S&S, since it isn't what you're telling everyone else. His words hit me like a ton of bricks, and I felt my eyes begin to sting at the thought of my fears. I widened my eyes in an effort to let more air hit the surface area of them, thus helping them dry out. Why are you making that face? What face? That, with the big eyes. Nothing, I said, smiling, blinking, and feeling relieved that the tears had subsided as a result of the distraction. Why won't you talk to me about it? He asked. The waitress came back with our coffees, and Joe handed her the menus, ordering two slices of pie, one chocolate and one apple. Because I don't talk to anybody about it, I said. It's my own stuff. Tortured artist stuff. Self-doubt, whatever, not worth discussing. Do you think you'll feel a pressure to perform once you're living there? I let out a humorless laugh. That's all I'll feel when I'm living there. That's the whole point. It's basically a scholarship with the expectation that I'll make something great of myself. The whole point of me getting to live there is that I'll perform. Well, do you still like making art? I paused, taking a deep breath. Yes, I said thoughtfully. I truly do. And I'm very thankful. I know you're thankful, Lou. I heard you say that like a hundred times. I'm also terrified, I said. That's probably the part you're picking up on. The part I try not to show anybody. Terrified of what? Of not meeting their expectations, I said. I guess that's what it comes down to. I mean, I know I won't have trouble with conduct or get myself kicked out for that type of thing. I just don't want to let anybody down. I also realize I should be excited about that documentary. It's going to help my career so much. Do you not want to do it? Not really, I said. I stared at him with a completely serious expression. I'm not the type of person who likes to let people see into my life, my personal space. I'm not looking forward to it if you want to know the truth. I smiled. But I've done a lot of things that I wasn't looking forward to, and they turned out great. No one ever said success comes easy. You just have to step out of your box sometimes. You're pretty tough, he said after looking me over for a few seconds. Not tough enough if you knew I was bluffing, I said. I only know you're bluffing because I care about you, he said. I'm more persistent than tough, I said, accidentally blowing past his statement about caring for me. Those two are one and the same, he said. It takes one to have the other. I squinted and smirked as I tried, for a second, to think about what he was saying. Just then, Belle came up with our pie. She set the plates in front of us and asked if we needed anything else before taking off again. Have you thought about saying no to the documentary? No. Nobody would say no. It's an honor to get chosen. I guess I'm just trying to set some mental guidelines for myself so that I don't get on camera and start gushing. I usually keep my insecurities to myself, and I guess I'm just afraid the producers will try to play up that side of it, especially since I'm the noob. I'll just go over there when they're interviewing you, Joe said. I'll keep them in line. I giggled as I took a bite of chocolate pie, but Joe didn't smile. Oh, you're just going to go up there and keep everybody in line? I asked, teasing him. He nodded without cracking a smile, which made me smile even more. Finally, he grinned. I really will if you want me to, though. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to have someone with you when they're filming. I'll be fine, I said. I'm just trying to talk it out now so I know what I will and won't say. Or at least what I should or shouldn't say. What are they going to ask you? He asked. I shrugged. I don't know. We're still at the very beginning of all of this. I barely just got accepted to SNS, and then they told me I was doing the film, too. What is SNS? He asked. He already knew that it was artist housing, 
and that I'd be staying there rent-free for two years starting in August. I knew by the way he phrased his question that he wanted to get more of a feel for what it was all about. Theo Duval, I said. He's French-Canadian, an artist and art dealer. He used to struggle and make ends meet as an artist in New York, and he always wished he had a place to sleep and shower so that he could concentrate on his art, rather than live frustrated trying to make the bills. Anyway, when he made enough money, he bought a whole building. You know which one. The first floor is a gallery, and the second is artist housing. There are 30 artists living there at any given time. I knew a little about the place, he said. I actually went in there one time. I just didn't know that guy's story. He's really cool, I said. The bulk of the documentary will be centered around him. Joe and I started talking about his work after that. I knew he had his hand in several different business ventures, most of them centered around app development, but he told me a lot more about what went into it. Joe was one of those guys who was smart enough to buckle down and become a success at something. It's not like he had a love for software design, though. His mission was to work hard at something he didn't mind doing with the sole purpose of making enough money to retire early. He wanted to travel and buy a nice house and to not have to worry about college for his future children and grandchildren. He said he was almost at the point where he would stop hustling so much, but for now he was moving and shaking and making the most of any business opportunity that lie in his path. He had high hopes for the sports app he'd been talking about with Ethan and Michael, and he told me some about their plans. We sat across from each other for what seemed like a few minutes, but was really over an hour. Belle brought us our check, saying she was getting off work, but that we should take our time because Sheila would be over to help us shortly. Joe and I were both ready to go, so we settled our tab with her and went to catch a cab. Joe gave the cab driver my address which surprised me since we would have to pass his place on our way there. I didn't say anything because I wanted him to ride with me all the way home. Joe paid the driver when we got to my house, and he got out with me, saying he wanted to walk me up. I obviously didn't argue. We spoke to the doorman. There had been a change of shift since Joe picked me up, and he introduced himself to Lionel, who was working the night shift. The older man complimented me on my dress, and I told him he should have seen me at the start of the night. We were still smiling about that when the elevator door closed, taking us up to the twelfth floor. Joe stood against one side while I stood against the other, and we looked at each other in wonderfully awkward silence. In my mind, he was imagining crashing into me in one of those desperate, passionate elevator kisses you see in movies, but I honestly had no idea what he was really thinking. He could have been thinking of the color of the walls, or meeting the doorman, or anything else. What? he asked. I was wondering the same thing, I said. He gave me a puzzled look, and I said, What you were thinking? He gave me a flirtatious smile and shook his head like he wasn't going to tell me. What? I asked. Tell me. He continued to shake his head with that irresistible, teasing grin but just then the elevator door opened with a ding. Are you coming in? I asked. If I'm invited. I smiled and pulled him out of the elevator by his sleeve. Cordially. Chapter 15 It was 2 p.m. when I woke up the next day. I looked around the living room, putting the pieces together and remembering the night before. Joe and I had stayed up all night, having conversations that led us to really get to know one another better. I knew he was still there, because his jacket, shoes, and keys were still sitting near the chair. It was nine o'clock in the morning when Joe finally went to Sarah's room to go to sleep. He had kissed me on the forehead and told me he'd see me in the morning. I smiled at the memory of telling him it was morning, for which he tickled me gently. I hadn't expected us to sleep this late, and I peered into the bedroom, trying to see if he was still sleeping. It was no use trying to see in, so I just flopped my head onto the pillow. I needed a second to wake up, so I stayed there, replaying portions of our time together the evening before. I couldn't help but smile. I had been smitten with him since the second I laid eyes on him. That was over five years ago, and it felt so good to finally have him looking at me like I wished he had all this time. 
We played silly games like Would You Rather and Truth or Dare, and we laughed until our faces hurt. We had serious moments, too. We talked about things like our parents and childhood and our faith and philosophy on life in general. We were different, but in a way I thought we could ultimately balance one another. Joe had a little brother through the Big Brothers program, and he told me some of the funny and touching things he'd encountered with the nine-year-old named Josh Flowers. I smiled, remembering how Joe told me Josh always introduced himself with his first and last name like a newscaster. Joe had gotten Nick's tickets where Josh got to meet a couple of the players, and he told me about the boys shaking their hands and introducing himself by first and last name like a little politician. Joe had been doing the program for over a year and had been assigned to Josh the whole time, so they had gotten close by now. He saw him every couple of weeks like clockwork. I loved the fact that he had a little brother. I loved how he looked and smelled, and I also loved his kind, generous heart. Every minute I spent with him only served to make me love him more. I stayed on the couch for what must have been ten minutes before my thoughts turned to the time of day. I picked up my phone and stared at it again, noticing the little calendar notification. Oh, snap. I had to walk a dog today. Ben's dog. Ben was a friend and co-worker at the coffee shop slash gelato bar where I worked part-time. He specifically asked me to take his dog for a walk at 3 p.m. today, and I had agreed to that exact time. I knew it would take me at least 20 minutes to get to Ben's apartment, so I pried myself off of the couch and shuffled quietly into the bedroom. At about 2 a.m., Joe and I had the bright idea to take a cab to his apartment to get some comfortable clothes for him to change into. Looking back on it, I don't know why I didn't just sleep on the couch at his apartment once we were there but we just didn't think of it at the time. I blame the fact that it was the middle of the night. We had the cab driver stop for a pita sandwich on our way back to Sarah's place, which was 3 a.m. We also had a little cup of coffee at that time. We were up until 9 a.m., and now it was the middle of the afternoon, and I had to get to Ben's house so his dog didn't have an accident. I entered the bedroom quietly, and there he was, sprawled out on his sister's bed looking like a big slice of wonderful. He had on a t-shirt and some sweatpants, and one leg was kicked out of the covers. His arm was positioned above his head, and I stared at him, wishing I had some paper and a pencil at this very moment. His chest and arms were on full display, and his face was just as artistically inspiring when he was asleep as it was when he was awake. I had my phone in my hand, and I stood there, contemplating whether or not it would be weird of me to take a picture of him like this so I could draw it later. I decided it would be quite weird, so I obviously didn't do it. I smiled, deciding it was a good idea to keep it to myself that I even thought about it. I walked over there to wake him up. Joe heard the floor creak beneath my feet, and he stirred and blinked, shifting so that he was on his side, facing the edge of the bed. He smiled sleepily at me, barely opening his eyes when I sat on the edge of the bed next to him. His hand came out of the covers and made contact with my thigh, which sent chills up my spine. I reached out and put my hand on his, even though I was still a little apprehensive around him. I have to get dressed and get out of here pretty soon, and I didn't want to take off before talking to you, I said. He picked his head up, regarding the bedside clock. Where are you going? He asked sleepily, tugging on my pants. I stared down at him, unable to fully appreciate the night we had together and my feelings about him. Nothing had happened between us, aside from a swift but sweet kiss at the end of the night, or that morning, whatever you want to call it. But I knew I had it bad. It was really bad. I have to walk a dog. He squinted out of one eye. What dog? My friend Ben from work, I told him I'd do it at three, and it's after two already. I have to get going. What kind of dog? Boxer. What are you supposed to do? He's got a certain walk he takes, I said. I've done it before. He's got other people who do it most of the time, but I do it once or twice a month. I reached out and touched the place on the side of his face where the hair met his temple. Did you sleep good? I asked. He nodded. You? Too good. I almost slept through the walk. This bed's comfortable he said, shifting. You should have taken it and let me sleep on the couch. 
The couch is where I always sleep, I said. That is my bed. Not for long, he said. Nope, not for long. Because you're going to move into the bedroom once Sarah gets her stuff out of here. I giggled and shook my head, rolling my eyes at him a little for being a clown. I'm serious, he said. You're moving in here once Sarah leaves. I got lost in the way his whiskers grew on his jawline, and I was staring at that spot when he wrapped his arms around my waist, holding me in place. I knew from things Joe said to me the night before that he was serious about me staying here until August. And since I didn't want to leave and go crash on Drake's couch anyway, I decided not to continue protesting. Besides, Joe seemed pretty adamant about it. If it would seriously make you feel better, then I'll stay. But if it's about me, then I don't want you to feel like you need to do that. I don't mind staying at Drake. It would make me feel better. He cuddled up to me even tighter. Let's just call it settled, he added. I leaned into him, resting my back against his chest and shoulder. I didn't know you had to go walk a dog, he said. Me neither. I forgot all about it until like three minutes ago. Thank goodness I woke up when I did. I can't believe we slept till the middle of the afternoon. Well, we did stay up till the middle of the morning. We ate pitas at 3 a.m., I said. We sure did. I walked all around the city in sequins and high heels. Yes, you did, he said. Then we ate pie. I smiled. I wish I had some of that pie right now. Let's stop and get some coffee and something to eat on the way to walk that dog. I leaned in, placing my hand on the side of his face and regarding him with a big grin. Are you coming with me? I asked. He nodded sleepily. If you want. I want, I said. Joe stretched and flexed before sitting up and swiveling to sit next to me on the edge of the bed, and I put a chaste kiss on his cheek before going out to the living room to get dressed. I didn't have a lot of personal possessions, because I tried to stay out of Sarah's way as much as possible. Sarah had been kind enough to let me take over the coat closet for my things. It was a nice-sized closet, but small considering the fact that I tried to keep all of my personal belongings contained inside of it. My bathroom things were in a small piece of luggage that I carted to and from the bathroom when I needed to use them. Even if it were only for a few months, it would be a crazy, amazing experience having an apartment like this to myself. I imagined myself being extremely inspired and making piece after piece of great art. Just as I was daydreaming about all the great art I'd create in this place, a concept hit me. I saw a vision of something I'd draw as soon as I had time to sit down with my charcoal. It was a piece I'd make as a gift, and I grinned at the thought of it. I could picture it exactly in my mind. I knew how to execute it precisely. I almost told Joe about my idea, but I kept it to myself just in case I decided not to do it. Both of us got dressed and headed to Ben's house. It was a nice day, so we decided to take Rascal on a long walk. He enjoyed it, but he was old, so he was delighted to get back. He collapsed onto the cold tile floor in the kitchen the second we came inside. That's a little ridiculous, Joe said, staring down at him. Dramatic if you ask me, I said, teasing the dog. Ben's apartment was cramped, nothing at all like Sarah or Joe's. Joe was on one side of the kitchen, I was on the other, and our feet were almost touching in the middle. Joe was dressed casually in the clothes we had gotten from his apartment the night before. His hair was windblown and had fallen over one side of his forehead. I find that I like having you at arm's length, he said. Right where I can reach out and touch you. He leaned forward, reaching out to poke my arm, which made me smile. I wanted to say something inspiring about what a pleasure and honor it was to be at his arm's length, but instead I said, I like your arm. I truly said that sentence, and then just smiled at him like I stood behind it and thought it made sense. Joe gave a quick flex to his bicep. Thank you, he said in a funny deep voice that made him sound a bit like a radio DJ. I laughed and held my arms out, almost reaching him even though we were on opposite sides of the kitchen. I wiggled my fingertips. I like this too, I said. What do you like? I smiled. You. He grinned back at me. I knew you did, he said. Oh yeah? How? 
because you weren't as scared of that splinter as you let on. I know you well enough to know you're not the type who has to squirm and hide her eyes. He knew I knew he knew the truth, so there was no use in me denying it. I might not have been so squeamish if it were Grant who sat there with me and not you. Why does it have to be Grant? He asked. Why couldn't you have said Rebecca, for example? Because I thought I might get a little rise out of you if I said Grant. Wish granted. You're jealous? I said, smiling excitedly. He gave me an easy grin. Super jealous. He was being so casual with the way he said it that I honestly couldn't tell if he was joking or not. Was it wrong if I hoped he wasn't? I like you, Justice. What's that? He said, cupping his hand to his ear. I couldn't hear what you said just now. You like my justice? I had almost said I liked him jealous, but I changed my mind in midstream. I giggled as I leaned forward, pulling at his shirt, which only made him reach out and tug me into his arms. Never mind, I said. Chapter 16 The following week flew by. I had to work a few doubles at the coffee shop to make up for the shifts I had covered for my trip to Ireland. Plus, Sarah and Colin came home, and we helped Sarah pack and move into his place. She was happy that I would be keeping the apartment, but it came as a huge shock to her that it was all her brother's idea. She teased him, saying that by the time August came around, he'd have me talked out of moving into S&S altogether. I definitely didn't admit I wished that would actually happen. I just laughed when she said that since it had been a joke. I had spent a lot of time with Joe during the past week, and I found that I cared for him very much. I cared for him in the type of way that extended far past physical attraction. The physical attraction part didn't hurt, though and I was reaping the benefits of that aspect in this very moment. From my vantage point on the wooden bleachers that lined the gymnasium, I had a clear view of Joe, who was busy basketballing in all his athletic, masculine glory. Joe had roped Colin into playing this time, so Sarah was there as well, sitting next to me in the stands. That's Joe's little brother, she said, nudging me. I glanced at her to find that she was staring in the direction of the exit, I had seen photos of Josh, so I recognized him right away. He had on jeans with a t-shirt and a navy blue hooded jacket. He began walking toward us, but it didn't look like he saw us or even knew to look for us. I was supposed to meet him last Tuesday, but he was sick, I said. That's why Joe asked him to come here today. I think we might take him to eat pizza after this. Josh wasn't looking at Sarah and me as he approached, so I stopped speaking to Sarah for a moment so that I could get his attention. Josh, I called. The boy looked up at me, and I smiled and waved. It was comical watching his face go from thinking I was someone he knew to realizing I was not. We know Joe, I explained. You know me, Joshua, Sarah said. He looked at Sarah for the first time, and he smiled when he recognized her. He climbed up and took a spot one row below us. When do you start coming to Joe's basketball games? he asked Sarah, since he only recognized her from other places. Sarah gestured onto the basketball court. My husband is playing with him today. Josh gave Sarah a sideways grin. I didn't know you were married. Her eyes widened. I wasn't until the other day. Really? You just got married the other day? She smiled and nodded, and Josh just stared at her dazedly. I thought he might say something to congratulate her, but instead his head whipped around to the basketball court, and he said, Which one is he? Guess, Sarah said. The one with the gray and green Air Max, Josh said with no hesitation. He's the only new guy on the team. They're missing the one with the poofy orange hair and the headband. Who's she? Josh said with a thumb aimed at me. My friend, Lou. He smiled, and I extended my hand for him to shake. I'm Josh Flowers. What kind of name is Lou for a girl? A weird one. I said. I smiled. Maybe not as weird as Theodore or Eugene, though. Josh let out a hearty laugh at that. I got a girl at my school named Michael. Michael's not that weird for a girl, Sarah said. Theodore, Josh said, laughing. Lou is a nickname, I said. What's your real name? Luli. Josh laughed at that, and Sarah nudged him with her foot. What? It's not as funny as some names, 
I got a girl in my class named Chandra Liliana, and we have to say the whole thing every time because she don't want to go by Sean or anything. She gets mad if you don't say her whole name. I think it's nice of you to make your nickname Lou since nobody ever heard of Lulan or whatever you said your real name was. Josh is my nickname, too, for Joshua. Josh Flowers. Speaking of, I drew you a picture, I said. He tilted his head at me like he was perplexed at why I would do such a thing. I thought Joe told you I had something for you, I said. He said he did, or him and his girlfriend did. I stared at Josh with a deer-in-the-headlights expression since I had no idea what to say. I was relatively sure Joe had been referring to me when he said girlfriend, but something inside me wouldn't clarify that with Sarah sitting right next to me. I drew you something, I said, trying not to be awkward while still not addressing his statement. I brought an oversized messenger bag with me, which contained an 8x10 drawing that I had put in a simple, low-profile frame. Unless traveling, I usually worked with nothing smaller than 11x14. But he was a kid, and I didn't know how much room he had, so I made it smaller. I took the framed drawing out of my bag and handed it to him, watching as he stared down at it. His eyebrows furrowed as he studied it intently. I had drawn the letters J-O-S-H, each stemming from a flower pot at the bottom of the page. I had a gritty, whimsical style that contrasted the fact that each letter was its own intricate flower, or cluster of flowers. Josh stared at it for what must have been 20 or 30 seconds before Sarah got antsy and said, See it? Josh flowers, get it? They are Josh, pause, flowers. The boy stared at it for a few more seconds before looking at me with a genuinely confused expression. This is me, he said, shaking the frame at me. It's me in a picture. It's my exact name as a picture. It's Josh Flowers. Who drew this? Lou, Sarah said proudly. He stared at me. Why? he asked. I shrugged. Because I thought Josh Flowers should have some Josh Flowers. He got that faraway look in his eye as he contemplated what I was saying, and I smiled watching him. I could tell he loved it. How do you know my name? He asked. Because she's Joe's girlfriend, Sarah said. Sarah knew Joe and I were spending time together, but she and I had never, I repeat, never said the word girlfriend. I felt woozy when she said it, like all the blood that was in my head suddenly left. I thought you said she was your friend, Josh said. Sarah smiled. She is. She was my friend first. We went to art school together. Can't you tell? She gestured at the drawing again, and Josh focused on it. I can't believe it is me, he said. All of his emphasis was on the word is in that sentence, which made me smile. He didn't see me because he had gotten lost staring at the picture again. Every letter is a flower, he said. Pretty cool, huh? Sarah asked. Yep, he said. Nobody else's name can do this, I bet. He looked at me for confirmation, and I smiled. Not very many, I agreed. People in your family could maybe do it, if they have the same last name. My daddy has my last name, but he don't stay at our house. I smiled. Then you're the only one who could have a picture like that. Yeah, because my mom's name is Jamie Milton. I made a face like I was thinking about it. I don't think I could draw Jamie Milton, I said, unless I just drew a portrait of her face, but that's not really what we're talking about here, huh? No, Josh said seriously, making me smile. Are you Joe's girlfriend? I was so nervous that I smiled and made an awkward shrugging gesture that neither confirmed nor denied his question. Did he quit that other girl? Josh, Sarah said, scolding him a little. What? I'm glad if he did. She never would have made something like this. She didn't even know my name hardly. Plus, she was too tall. She was almost as tall as Joe. He pulled back, looking at me and measuring me up in case he had put his foot in his mouth. My heart was beating a thousand miles an hour as a result of all the Chelsea talk. How long you been Joe's girlfriend? He asked. I don't know. I didn't even really know we were calling it that. I guess about a week or so, 
I thought I was maybe going to get to meet you on Tuesday. But I got strep throat, he said. I heard about that. I'm glad you're feeling better. Is that why you made me this? He asked, lifting the picture. It would be a nice get well gift, but I just made it because your name sounded like it should be a picture. Plus, Joe told me all about how cool you were, so I knew you'd get it. Oh, man, I saw it right when I looked at it. Josh Flowers. I'm glad you like it, I said, leaning back to watch the game. Josh didn't offer any words of thanks, but he used the opportunity to come sit right next to me, which I took to mean the same thing. Joe got me this jacket, he said, leaning over to put his arm right in front of me. I held his arm, feeling the hoodie. That's nice, I said. And these shoes. Really? Those are nice, too. They match your jacket. Yeah, he got them for my birthday with a new watch, but I left it at home. He's probably going to get you something good for your birthday, too. If you're his girlfriend still by then. He's super generous, I said. He was telling me that he wanted to take us for pizza and ice cream after this. Yes, Josh said. I knew it. I guess I'm going to have to wait on my diet. Are you on a diet? Sarah asked. Not really, but I need to be because everybody says I'm fat. You're not fat, Sarah said. I agree, I said. He truly wasn't. He was stocky, but I definitely wouldn't use the word fat to describe him. Not even close. It's mostly just Byron Carter who says it, he said. He's my pain in the back since kindergarten. He says I'm fat and I can't catch, but I can. It's just that he throws it to me when I'm not looking. I put my hand on his back, wishing I could take all of his pain and embarrassment away. I would never, ever, ever want to be friends with Byron Carter, I said. Yes, you would if you met him. Everybody wants to be his friend. I sat there, not knowing what to say. I wasn't expecting to have to give life advice to this kid. Well, sometimes God gives us pains in the backs, Josh. Sometimes it happens for reasons we don't understand. What, like he's going to start being nice later? I shrugged. Maybe, but not necessarily. Maybe it'll have nothing to do with Byron. Sometimes we don't know why things happen until way later, and sometimes we maybe never figure it out. But nothing is wasted. If nothing else, you can look at this kid and know how you don't want to act. I smiled at him. I definitely think you should have pizza and ice cream with us, though. That dude doesn't know what he's talking about. I think you're really handsome. And I have good taste, so that should tell you something. Josh looked at Sarah, who agreed. Me too, and I have really good taste too. You're going to grow up to be a handsome man, I can tell. Josh nodded, wearing such a thoughtful expression that I had to work to hold in a smile. The three of us sat there and watched the rest of the game, Sarah and me asking Josh questions about his school and answering the ones he had for us, which were mostly related to our feelings on pop culture. We would go for minutes at a time without talking, though. Josh liked the game of basketball, and Sarah and I were just happy to stare at our respective crushes, so silences were okay with all of us. I loved watching Joe interact with the guys on the court. The way they bantered and smiled at each other as they played made me feel proud of him. It was fun to watch him excel at a sport and look good doing it. Colin wasn't bad himself, and Sarah and I would pinch and poke each other every time one of them did something we deemed worthy of such a reaction which was just about constantly. Chapter 17 There was no scoreboard, but I assumed our guys won since they were all smiles after the game. Colin and Joe met us at the front of the gym after going by the locker room with the rest of the guys. Josh had been standing there with Sarah and me, but he took off running toward Joe when they came walking down the hall. He had the drawing in his hand, and it was the very first thing he showed them. He held it out as they approached each other, and I watched as both Joe and Colin leaned in to take a look at it. Joe was pretending to be amazed because he has already seen it, but Colin seemed like he really was. They were too far away for me to hear what they were saying, but there were definitely words exchanged as they took turns pointing at the picture. The boys stayed there for what seemed like a full minute, gawking over the drawing and talking to Josh, before heading in our direction. The five of us collided at the front entrance of the gym. Colin walked right up to Sarah, taking her into his arms and kissing her forehead several times, 
like he just couldn't help himself. She congratulated him for playing well, and he thanked her. Joe didn't take me into his arms like Colin had done with Sarah, but he came to stand next to me, smiling and nudging his chin at me as if checking in. I smiled back at him and nudged my chin, too. Josh likes his artwork, he said. He glanced at the boy. Did you tell her thank you? Josh stared at me with wide eyes as if trying to remember if he had or not. Thank you, he said, just in case. You're very welcome. I'm glad you like it. I love it. I'm like the only person in the world who has a picture. Josh smiled and tousled the boy's hair. The one and only Josh Flowers, he said. Come on, let's go get some pizza. Sarah and Colin are coming too, Josh said. He had already set the whole thing up with Sarah while we watched the game, but she hadn't yet told Colin. What are we doing? Colin asked. Pizza, Josh said, and then ice cream. Pizza and ice cream, Sarah said, blinking up at Colin. Good grief. They were so cute that I had to look away. Joe must have seen me squirm because he came to stand behind me, leaning in to kiss my cheek. Wanna head out? He asked in my ear. I smiled and nodded, and he tugged me toward the door, leaving everyone to follow behind us. Colin owned quite a few restaurants, and since he happened to have one that served pizza within a reasonable distance, that's where we chose to eat. I was so glad we did that, because Josh got the royal treatment. Colin took him into the kitchen where Josh got to watch the chefs make the pizza and fire it in the wood-burning oven. Joe and I waited at the table, and Josh told us all about it when he got back. Colin had ice cream at the restaurant, but we decided to go to Ben and Jerry's since there was one nearby. Colin and Sarah decided not to join us for ice cream, so after dinner, Joe and I headed out with Josh. He held on to his drawing the whole time, waiting anxiously for opportunities to tell someone about it. He had shown it to two different people at the restaurant, and that was just what I knew about. Josh carried it with him when he went to the kitchen so he probably showed it to people in there as well. He showed it to a random person walking down the street, and also the person working the register of Ben and Jerry's. It was incredibly fun watching how proud he was of that thing. I felt humbled by it. I had drawn it on some beautiful paper that was bought for me by the man who had also agreed to pay my rent for the next few months. The conditions under which I made that piece of art were so lavish and undeserved that I almost felt guilty for being able to watch Josh adore it so much. It seriously brought tears to my eyes, and I had to fight them back. It was hard to believe that just a few weeks ago, I was feeling discouraged, like I might not find joy in art anymore. And now here I was, looking at this little boy's face, which lit up when he showed people that drawing. After we paid for our ice cream, Joe and Josh went to get us a table. I asked Joe to take my bowl to the table so that I could use the restroom, and he agreed easily. It was crowded in there, so I wasn't too surprised to see them sitting at a table for two when I returned. Joe swiveled, sticking out a knee to indicate that I should sit on his lap. The tiny table displayed the 8x10 drawing, which was propped up, taking up just about the whole surface. I sent Joe a knowing smile at the way Josh set it up. My bowl of ice cream was sitting next to it, and I picked it up as I sat on Joe's knee. My heart raced as I got situated on his leg and turned to smile at him. We had been seeing each other all week, but we didn't yet have regular PDA, and the slightest contact had my endorphins on edge. There was a bigger table over there. Josh whispered the words into my ear so that Josh couldn't hear. He was telling me he wanted me to have to sit on his lap, which set my heart racing yet again. I swallowed, wondering if I should whisper back or leave it at that. I'm glad you picked this one, I whispered back when Josh was distracted. Josh looked back at us, and I smiled as if I thought we might have been caught, but we hadn't. Josh just smiled blissfully as he licked his ice cream cone. I was so crazy about Joe that I barely remembered the bowl of ice cream in my hand. Maybe it was from the exertion of playing basketball, or maybe it was the lighting in this place but his eyes seemed more green than usual. I stared at them from the close proximity of his lap, wondering how I ended up there. I like her way better than that other girl. What other girl? You know, Josh said, 
Chelsea. Oh, I totally forgot about her. I know, me too, Josh said, nodding. I smiled at both of them, even though my adrenaline was now pumping. As far as exes go, Chelsea was pretty low impact, low repercussion. That still didn't change the fact that I wished she didn't exist at all. Joe put his hand on my leg in a protective gesture, and I gave him a thankful smile. The three of us sat in comfortable silence while we finished our ice cream. We brought Josh home after that, and Joe promised he'd see him in a couple of weeks. He gave the cab driver his address after we dropped off the boy. I figured you'd come over to my place for a little while, he said. I smiled. You did? Uh-huh. What made you think that? Because I want you to. I inched closer to him and he put his hand on the other side of my legs, manually scooting me closer to him. I leaned against him. I can't believe how much Josh liked his picture, he said. I knew he would love it, but I didn't expect him to show it to every single person we encountered. I rested my head on Joe's shoulder and he used the hand that had been on my leg to touch the side of my face. I really like him. I said. He loves you, Joe said. He said if I don't marry you that he probably will. Did he really say that? I shifted to stare at Joe, who smiled and nodded. He said he wanted to marry a girl who could draw, Joe said. Aw, really? He nodded. How sweet, I said. I really liked him. Joe adjusted so his arm was around me, and I snuggled into him again. You smell clean, I said, taking a deep breath with my nose right up against his neck. Don't sound so surprised, he said with a smile in his voice. I thought you'd smell sweaty after your game. I took a shower, he said. A shower? I asked, pulling back and regarding him with a surprised expression that made him smile. What'd you think I was doing after the game? Changing. And showering he said. I was nasty. You looked good to me. I might have looked good, but you wouldn't want to smell me. I put my nose next to his neck and took another deep breath. I can't imagine not wanting to smell you, I said. I was so head over heels for him that I kissed his neck. It was right there in front of me, and I just couldn't resist any longer. I placed my lips on the upper part of his neck, right at the corner of his jaw. My mouth was slightly open, and I held it on his skin for a few seconds before pulling back. He leaned back and stared at me with an appraising grin before glancing at the front of the cab and then back at me again. What was that? He asked. I didn't say anything. What was that you did? You mean this? I put my slightly open mouth on his neck again and let it linger there for several long seconds. I felt and saw his chest rise and fall with one huge breath, and I smiled. I felt completely at home, nestled in the hollow spot of Joe's neck, and I really didn't care whether or not the cab driver was paying attention to us. Joe, I said with my mouth close to his ear. Yes, Lou. Am I your girl? I put another soft kiss next to his ear. You know you are, he said. How'd I get to be that? The splinter, remember? That night at the pub? I asked, pretending to have forgotten. Uh-huh. What happened? Did we fall in love or what? Yep, we did. Something happened that night. I have the picture that proves it. I remember that picture, I said. You wouldn't give it to me. Hey, I bought that picture fair and square. You didn't buy it fair and square at first, I said. You tried to steal it. Me and Drake had to count those photos and figure out one was missing behind our backs. You counted them? Joe asked. Yeah, to see if one was missing. I thought nobody would notice. Yeah, but then you got busted. And I paid dearly. I think I still owe you money from that transaction, I said. I knew right where those hundred dollar bills were. I hadn't spent any of it because of the memories that went with them. You know what you need to give me? Joe asked. What? He lifted his chin, indicating that he wanted me to kiss him again. 
which I did with no hesitation at all. Chapter 18 The next two months came and went in an amazing emotional whirlwind. Sarah had long since gotten the remainder of her things out of the apartment, and I was now the only resident there. She was a potter, which meant her art took up a lot of space. I hadn't even realized just how much space until she had it out of there. The place was beautiful, and it seemed huge once I was living there by myself. Joe and I had been steadily seeing each other since the Ireland trip. We made a conscious effort to take it slow at first, but as the weeks passed, we'd been seeing more and more of each other. I would be moving into S&S in less than a month, and I knew that would come as a rude awakening on multiple levels. My living accommodations would be nice, but I would, without a doubt, miss the apartment. A one-room flat with a mini-fridge and communal toilets and showers, no matter how nice it was, unfortunately could not hold a candle to Sarah's one-bedroom masterpiece with beautiful windows and a view. I would also miss Joe. I knew I'd still be able to see him once I moved in, but it wouldn't be nearly as much as I did currently. And that was the part I dreaded most. He and I didn't talk about it. We did a little at first, but we hadn't lately. He knew I was trying to remain in a positive headspace, so we just sort of fell into the habit of not discussing it at all. It was a random Tuesday in July, and I found myself having a bout with dread and fear that was unlike any of the others I'd previously had. This one made me sick to my stomach. At least, I thought that was what had done it. When I first woke up, I assumed that I was actually worrying myself sick, but as the day passed, I realized I was just plain ill. In fact, I wasn't sure if I had ever been so ill in my life. When I first started throwing up, I still thought it was from worry, so I didn't mention it to Joe when he texted me. By the time I actually talked to him on the phone later that afternoon, I was sick as a dog, a filthy dog, so, so sick. All day I had gone from my bed to the toilet. The day was one big miserable blur. I remember catching sight of my phone and realizing that it was ringing. I picked it up and held it to my ear, feeling confused. Hello? You had me worried, Joe said. I texted you a few times earlier and never heard back. Then I called. Uh-huh, I mumbled, knowing it was my turn to speak, but not being able to think of anything to say. Are you okay? Are you coming over? I asked. I could hear that my speech was slurred, but there was nothing I could do to make it come out correctly. I have that thing tonight with Ethan, remember? Do you need me to come over? No, 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 no. Lou, what's the matter? Silence. Lou? What? No, I just have a bellyache and stuff. Are you sick? No, 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 no. I knew as the mumbling was leaving my mouth that I was messing up, saying the wrong things, but I couldn't help it. It was like my body was just making noises without my permission. I'm coming over there, he said. I'll be there in a half hour. Are you okay till then? No, go to your thing with Ethan. I'm good and fine. I just have a bellyache. A cramp came over me and I convulsed in a painful, tingling wave of bodily sensations that had me clinching my eyes closed tight. I would have thrown up if I had anything at all left in my body. I barely even remembered that I had my phone up to my ear until I heard Joe calling my name. Lou. Lou, are you there? I am, I said. I just get a wave. What's a wave? You know where it hits you like that? I was trying to say my words right, but I knew I was failing. Listen, I just think I have a stomachache. I said, I'm gonna have to call you back. I'm on my way over there, I heard him say. Another wave hit me. This one was laced with exhaustion, and I felt myself drifting to sleep. I knew I needed rest, so I smiled internally as I gave in to it. I'm just gonna take a nap, I said. You go do, Ethan.
I must have been really failing at getting my words out correctly, because he asked if I needed an ambulance. That jolted me into a little more consciousness, and I told him I definitely didn't need that. I think he made me stay on the phone with him until he got there. He talked in my ear for what seemed like two minutes, and at the same time like two days, and the next thing I knew, Joe was walking across my bedroom with an intense expression on his face. I remember looking at him and distinctly thinking he was an angel, there to rescue me. The angel went to his knees at the side of my bed, regarding me like I was some precious possession that he was afraid of losing. His hand came to my head, and I felt him adjust some hair that had been in my face. I tried to smile to show him how thankful I was to have him there. He asked me several questions, and in spite of me doing my best to answer them, I ended up in the back of a car that was headed to a hospital. Is it an ambulance? I asked. I remembered Joe saying I needed to go to the hospital, but it didn't seem like we were in an ambulance. I remembered him helping me down the elevator and outside, but I thought we got into a black car. We're in my dad's car, he said. His driver was in the neighborhood. He's taking us to the hospital so we can get you some fluids. That's gonna make me feel better, I said. I felt his warm hand rub my head. Yep. There was a pause, and then he said, What made you sick? Do you know? If I had been thinking straight, I would have said it was something I ate or it was a virus, but I was out of my head at the moment, so I said the truth, which was, I thought it was worrying, but I think it's way, way worse than that. What do you mean you thought it was worrying? I mean, I thought I was worrying myself sick. I said, without taking my head off of his chest. About what? What do you think? S and S, moving in, leaving the apartment, the documentary, choking under pressure, regretting something, making mistakes, making a fool of myself. You, missing you. Mostly missing you. I can't stand it. I don't want to leave what I have right now. I wish I could just pause this little moment of my life and just have the rest of it be the same as it is right now. The exact same as it is right now. I mean, not the throwing up part, because I hate throwing. Another cramp hit me, and I screwed up my face and hunched over, trying to ease it by repositioning. Do you need the pan? He asked. I shook my head since I knew I had nothing left to come up. Joe held me tightly and waited for it to be over. I'm sorry, that was a bad one. What was I saying? You were trying to tell me what made you sick, Joe said. The thought of why I was sick made me remember that when I first started feeling it, I thought I was worried sick. Then I remembered that I already knew that and had just spilled my guts to Joe about it. I pulled back to focus on him, wondering how much I had just said. What did I just tell you? I asked. Did I say a bunch of stuff out loud or just think about it? Joe smiled at me. You just thought about it, he said. I rested my head on his chest again, drifting off during a brief window when my stomach wasn't tensed and cramped. I remember most of the ER experience, but only in flashes. Joe talked to the nurses, helping me get checked in. It seemed to all go smoothly, and at one point it crossed my mind to wonder if he told them his dad was famous. I'm pretty sure I brought it up when the thought hit me, because I remember the nurses reacting and getting all excited about how Bad Medicine was their all-time favorite show. That whole time period was slightly choppy as far as consciousness was concerned, I knew they put an IV in me because I glanced at it as they were taping it onto my arm. I thought maybe they took some blood also, but I couldn't be sure. I heard Joe talking to them and them acting like everything was under control. And then I felt a cool, gushing sensation in my arm, right where the IV was going in. It felt like a cool stream of water. And then I realized that that's exactly what it was. I smiled at Joe and nodded drifting to sleep. 
I woke up feeling somewhat like a human again. I knew exactly where I was. I remembered drifting to sleep when the IV got started. I blinked at the open door of a hospital room before shifting my head on the pillow to stare in the opposite direction. Joe was sitting on the couch by the window with Ethan Prescott sitting next to him. They were having a conversation, and my first thought was that I was seeing things. My movement caught Joe's eye, and he turned to look at me, smiling when he saw that I was awake. There she is, he said, coming over to my bedside. Ethan stood, stretched, and walked over as well. I'm gonna take off, he said. He glanced down at me with a kind smile, which was completely surreal since his character on Bad Medicine was a doctor, and I had seen him on TV doing the same thing near a hospital bed. Joe and I were supposed to meet, he explained. I hope you don't mind that we just did it here. It's fine, I said, straightening up as I continued to take everything in. I managed to smile. I'm sorry you had to change your plans. The nurses weren't sorry, Joe said. Ethan smirked as he reached out to fist bump Joe. I wasn't sorry about meeting that one nurse either, Ethan said with a wink. He glanced at me and waved on his way around the foot of my bed. Hope you feel better, Lou. Thanks for letting me crash your hospital visit. I almost said I was honored he had or something goofy like that, but thankfully I had the presence of mind to keep quiet. I smiled and waved at him as he left the room. Thanks, bro. I'll call you later he said to Joe as he walked out. Sounds good, Joe said just before the door closed. He focused on me and smiled. I knew he could tell I was feeling human again without either of us saying anything. That was terrible, I said with a little relieved smile. Thank you so much for getting me over here. I glanced at the IV, which was on my left arm near my wrist. I think this helped. He let out a sigh, staring at me. How long did I sleep? I asked. Couple of hours. I sat up, feeling bad for taking up his time and making a mess of his meeting with Ethan. When can I go home? He smiled. I'm sure once they see you're feeling better. Just then we heard some taps on the door as it opened. A nurse walked in, beaming from ear to ear. Mr. Prescott said somebody was awake, she cooed in a cheery tone. Yep, I said. Am I good to go home? She laughed as she came to my bedside to look at my vitals. Before too long, I'm sure, she said. She stayed in my room for 10 or 15 minutes, asking me questions about what had made me sick and how I was now feeling on a scale of 1 through 10. Hospitals weren't necessarily my favorite place, so I answered everything as perfectly as I could to expedite a speedy checkout. The nurse assured me that no matter what had caused my stomach issues, the hardest part was over. She said I should come back if symptoms worsened, but that the likelihood of that happening was, well, it was highly unlikely. Joe called his dad's driver so that I didn't have to ride home in the back of a cab. I was still pretty out of it on the trip home, but at least I was headed to my own bed. I clung to the nurse's promise that the worst was over. Joe stayed with me that night. He was in and out of the bedroom, checking on me and bringing me things to eat that he thought might be easy on my stomach. We talked some, and other times he left me in there to rest while he went out to the living room, but he never left the apartment. He was there with me all night. Chapter 19 I woke up at 10 a.m. the following morning feeling like a new person. Okay, maybe not brand new, but I felt a heck of a lot better than I had the day before. I had been up at 6 a.m. and saw that Joe was sleeping on the couch, but I wasn't sure if he was still there when I woke up again at 10. I didn't have a text on my phone telling me he was leaving, so in the back of my mind, I assumed he would be out there. He wasn't. I went to the fridge and poured myself a glass of juice. I turned to lean on the kitchen counter and before I even put it to my lips, I heard the door open. You're up, he said. I glanced in the direction of the door to find that Joe was carrying two grocery bags. You didn't have anything to eat in here, he said. There was nothing in the fridge besides the stuff I got last time I went to the store. 
I don't know what you would eat if I didn't go to the store. Boots and raccoons, I said. He set the bags down on the counter next to me and regarded me with a teasing grin. Boots and raccoons? I smiled and nodded playfully. You mean that's what you'd eat if I didn't go shopping for you? I mean, that's what junk food's made of, and that's all I'd be eating if it weren't for you. Boots and raccoons, huh? I continued to smile and nod, and he leaned in to kiss my cheek like he just couldn't resist. I'm glad to see you're feeling better, he said, starting to put the groceries away. I turned to help him. Thank you for doing this, I said, and thank you for everything yesterday. I know it's not your job to take care of me when- Yes, it is, Joe said, cutting me off. Obviously. Well, thank you, I said. He was just about to cross to the fridge with a handful of groceries, but he paused in motion to smile and kiss me. We need to talk sometime when you're feeling better, he said. Cue the ominous music. Dun, dun, dun. My stomach flipped at the dreaded words, we need to talk. But I smiled and continued to put groceries away. About what? I asked casually. I don't want to get into it if you're still feeling sick, he said. He was so matter of fact about it that I felt scared he was breaking up with me. What, Joe? I am feeling better. I'm fine. Just say it. Let's get the groceries put up and we can go sit on the couch. I had never put up groceries so quickly in my life. I literally took one of the bags, all pantry items, and set it on the pantry shelf without taking any of the items out of it. It's not bad, Joe said with a little smirk on his face when he saw me do that. Then tell me. He reached around me, taking the bag out of the pantry so that he could put the items away properly. I want you to think about not going to S&S, he said as he stashed the boxes. What? I asked. I wore a look of such shock that Joe's face broke into a grin. This is why I wanted to put up the groceries, so we could sit down and talk about it. We need to sit down and have a conversation, Lou. There's nothing to say about it, I said, feeling blood rise to my cheeks. Joe gave me a patient smile, pulling me into his arms. Oh, but there are things to say, he said. He turned with me in his arms, him resting his backside against the cabinet, and me hugging him with my face on his chest, glued together, front to front in a tight hug. I know there's things we can say, I said, but we've already said them all. No, we haven't, Lou. We have options beyond you going to S&S. &S. You don't have to take that spot just because they offered it to you. I let out a little hopeless laugh. Yeah, but I'd be crazy not to. People are crazy all the time. You have options. You can decide not to go to s and and still go on with your life. You can still be a success as an artist without going. I stared at him, wishing life were as easy as deciding not to face my fears and everything's still working out okay. I sighed. Joe, I have to go, I said. As much as I really don't want to, it's something I have to do. I have to try to make it on my own. I have to prove to my parents that their faith in me wasn't wasted. He stared down at me with a thoughtful expression. I knew you were going to say all this before I ever brought it up to you. And you know what, Lou? You're wrong. I shot him a confused expression. You are. You can still make it as an artist and prove you're a success to your parents without going to SNS. He shrugged. Plus, I could choose to be offended about all this if I wanted to. How? Because you're willing to let some other guy pay your way. Some other guy who sees talent in you gets to pay your rent for two years. He paused and made a face at me. Why don't I get to be that guy? Why don't I get to sponsor an artist for two years just because I believe in her? This apartment's in my dad's name. What's stopping me from telling him I want to rent it so I can invest in some young talent like that Duval guy? He shrugged. Hey, but if you don't want to live here, then I could just hold auditions for someone who does. I'm sure Sarah knows some girls, uh, people, who'd be interested in the opening. I giggled and fake pounded his chest for teasing me. I could only imagine the line that would form for people to sign up for that deal.
It would be wrapped around the building five times. I knew I wouldn't let myself take him up on the offer, ultimately, but I felt a sense of relief at the sheer fact that Joe mentioned it. It was like I had a tiny glimmer of hope that I would escape doing that documentary, and I felt like I could instantly breathe easier. I smiled at him. You're the sweetest person I know for even offering this. I'm not just offering. I'm telling you I want you to do it. I'm telling you I want you to do what you feel is best for your life, your art, but if there is even a little inkling telling you that you don't want to go to SNS, I will be happy to make good on Theo's sponsorship right here in this apartment. You could just stay here. The corners of his mouth turned upward in a sweet smile as he rubbed my shoulders. I know it's a lot to think about, but I just wanted you to know you have options. They've probably never had anybody say they're not going to take their spot before, I said. So? So it's awkward to say you'll do something and then decide you won't. He shrugged again. Life's awkward sometimes. You just talk to them and make it unawkward. Tell them the truth, that you don't need the room anymore. I smiled against his chest, wondering if it could possibly be as easy as he made it seem. Joe made everything seem easy. I think I might have said a bunch of stuff to you when I was out of it, I said. I don't want you to think I don't want to go to SNS. He smiled. You don't. Yeah, but it's an honor, I said. So is the Joe Spicer Accounts Liable Apartment Act for Artists? I cracked up in his arms, letting my forehead rub against his chest as I shook my head at him. You said Liable Apartment Act. I said, giggling. That's what it is, Joe defended, and you're trying to tell me you'd rather take that other offer from across town. He paused, but then continued. No, seriously, baby. I'm sure you can work something out where you can still get to put your stuff in the gallery. Talk to Lane. I bet you can even work there part-time instead of the coffee shop. If not, and they tell you to go take a hike, we'll find another gallery. Lane was the manager of S&S and, &S and Theo's right hand. He would be the first person I'd call if I were to think about backing out. I kept my head on Joe's chest, feeling overwhelmed with the changing feelings brought on by his proposal. I let out a long sigh before stepping back so I could stare at him. There's nothing to be sad about, he said. It's a good thing that you have options. I know it is, but I just never thought I'd even be thinking about this I didn't think everything would play out like this. I thought the whole thing would revolve around this place called S&S and, &S and that my story would be there, you know? I thought that's how it would play out. But that's not how it played out, is it? He asked. I stared at him, wanting whatever option he was a part of. Joe, I can't let you foot the bill for this apartment, I said. Don't worry. I won't be doing it for the whole two years, he said. Why not? Because I'm going to get fed up and kick you out by then, he said. We both knew he was kidding, but we also knew he was making a vague reference to marrying me somewhere in there. Neither of us mentioned it. I'm not asking you to quit making art, Lou. I'm not trying to make you barefoot and pregnant or anything. Not yet, at least. I want you to do what you need to do artistically. Set your goals and go for them. I just think it makes as much sense for you to take a sponsorship from someone who loves you as it does from a random French Canadian. If I had to draw you right now, Mr. Spicer, I would make you a fierce warrior sitting on a horse, one who was capable of the slaying dragons and rescuing me from lava pits and sea serpents. If I were to draw you right now, it would be terrible because I can't draw, he said, making me giggle. And if you could, I asked. I'd draw you believing me when I say that renting this apartment is the very least of things I'd be willing to do for you, Lou. I don't know how I'd draw believing. I don't want you to draw it. I just want you to do it. Do what? I asked, even though I knew the answer. Believe me when I say I want to make you happy. I want you to choose exactly what would make you happy. Lou, I'm capable of providing this place for you. If you would rather stay here than at SNS for the next two years, then please do it. I want you to. Do you think I really could back out? 
I asked, feeling like I could breathe for the first time in months. Yes, he said with a smile in his voice, as if he really couldn't fathom I had a hard time believing it. And you can probably work something out where you still work with the gallery. I'm sure you could talk to Lane about it. I gave him a smile that reflected what a surreal situation I found myself in. I know I said something about not wanting to go there when I was sick, I said, feeling frustrated with myself for letting my insecurities show. I can't believe you didn't say that to me sooner, Joe said. I can't believe it took you being out of your mind with dehydration to tell me the truth. You know I have money, Lou. Yeah, but I'm not your responsibility. You're more my responsibility than you are Theo Duval's. I smiled. Touché, I guess. Listen, I know you're capable of making it on your own, Lou. You could make it without me or Theo. You're a hustler, and you would make it happen. That's all there is to it. But I'd love to be a part of your journey, part of your story. I want you to stay here and make art and be my girlfriend. I'll take care of you, and you'll take care of me, and neither of us have to worry about doing a documentary about it. I really don't want to do that documentary, I said. It felt so good to be in complete control of all my senses and still be admitting that. I'm crazy for not wanting to do it with all of the exposure it would provide. Maybe you are. Maybe I'm wrong for telling you not to do it. Just know that you have options, Lou and that if it was up to me, you'd sign up for the Joe Spicer Scholarship Act. It's not what you called it a minute ago, I said, smiling. Oh, yeah? What did I call it? The Joe Spicer Liability Something or Other. I think the Scholarship Act is better, he said. I grinned. The other one had the word apartment in it, which I liked. He widened his eyes at me. You must be considering signing up for it if you're so obsessed with the name, little lady. I laughed. I have to know the name of it if I'm going to apply. He shrugged casually. Just because you apply doesn't mean you'll get in, he said. I have a ton of applicants. I've got more than I can handle. Eligible female artists lining up down the block to apply for this. He was kidding. But I knew it would actually be the truth if this scholarship, or whatever it was, actually existed. Wait a minute, I said, pretending to be confused. I thought you said that the spot was definitely mine. You just told me to quit my other thing so that I could come here. Did you quit that other thing? He asked. Is there a spot for me if I did? I asked, looking cautious and skeptical. Yes, he said with no hesitation. I'll throw away all those other applications right now. Put them through the shredder. Consider them gone. Well, consider your spot filled, I said, even though it made my stomach flip to say it. Really? He asked, staring down at me. We had been joking around with each other a little bit, but he smiled at me sincerely. You can take a day to think about it, he said. I smiled and shook my head. No thanks. I'll take it. Chapter 20 I found myself on the wooden gymnasium bleachers where I first met Josh. Sarah was there with me because Colin had been roped into playing again. Josh was meeting us there, and we would go for pizza and ice cream afterward, which had become a bi-weekly tradition. It had only been a few days since I made the decision not to go to S&S, and it still seemed a little unreal. Although the option I chose was better, it was still hard for me to believe I was passing up an opportunity like that. Even after I made up my mind, it took me two days to go see Lane and tell him. In fact, neither Joe nor I had told anyone until this morning, simply because I was working up the nerve. It wasn't really the type of news Joe needed to share with anyone anyway, except for maybe his dad when they worked out the lease situation. As of this afternoon, Sarah knew about it, but she didn't know all the details. I told her I'd tell her everything at the gym so it didn't surprise me when I walked in to find her staring at me with a curious smile. What happened? she asked, before I even sat down next to her. We hugged as I got settled in the stands. I'm not going to live at the collective, I said. You told me that, but how did this come about? I sighed. 
not knowing where to begin. I know it must seem ridiculous from the outside looking in, but it's actually good for me. It's not ridiculous, she said with a smile. Her reaction surprised me, because I assumed everyone would think I was nuts for passing up the opportunity. She leaned into me with her shoulder. I see you and Joe together, Lou. I knew it would be hard on you guys to have you up there with those showers and everything. I giggled at Sarah, who had always been hung up on the communal showers since day one. He did it for me, actually, I said. He knew I was terrified of doing that documentary. You were terrified? She asked, looking shocked. I smiled. So terrified. But I was terrified to apply for SNS, and I was terrified at Columbia. I'm pretty much terrified to do everything with art, but I suck it up because that's just part of it. I was going to do the film and be happy about it. But yes, I was terrified. And I'm so relieved about backing out. I seriously could breathe better after I decided not to do it. She reached out and ran her hand down my back, shaking her head as we watched the guys warming up. I wouldn't want to do it either if you want to know the truth. That's not my thing. Most people would think I'm nuts, I said. Yeah, but you got something even better, she said. I nodded, knowing it was the truth and feeling glad she could see it too. Sarah smiled at me like she knew how good this was, and she was truly happy for me. I could hear the screeching of sneakers and the dribbling of the ball, and I had the warmest and fuzziest of feelings. And I have two sets of good news from SNS, I said. You'll never believe how it worked out with my spot. How? I went to see Lane this morning to tell him about backing out, and... I paused and stared at the gymnasium floor with a smile, remembering how the whole thing went down. What happened? She asked. Okay, so, last week, Lane gets this call from a girl. She was on a Greyhound, headed for New York. She thought SNS was a homeless shelter for artists. It sort of is, Sarah said, grinning at the irony. I smiled. Yeah, but you know what I mean. She thought she could just call up and stay there because she was homeless, and she described herself as an artist. So anyway, she cried when Lane told her that wasn't how it worked, that it was a highly competitive program and many of the tenants had art degrees from Ivy League schools. And, being that she was from Texas and not quite used to Lane's matter-of-fact New York way of handling business, she busted out crying right there on the phone. You're kidding, Sarah said. What did Lane do? He felt bad. He listened to her story. She was raised in rural Texas by her grandparents. She's 25, and she's been working as a cashier at a grocery store since she graduated from high school. She said she's a painter, but she has absolutely no credentials whatsoever, no school, no portfolio, nothing. So what happened? I held out a finger, telling her to be patient. So she promises Lane on the phone that she's a real natural who just never had the chance to show the world what she can do. Lane said that she was so tenacious that he had no other choice but to meet her. He had three spots coming open in six months, and he figured he could keep her in mind for those if she was as good as she claimed to be. Is she getting your spot? Sarah asked, with wide eyes, making all the correct assumptions. I smiled and nodded. No way! I thought there were like ten other girls in the running with you. I shrugged. Long story short is that Lane met with her, and he said she's legit. He said she doesn't know a thing about art, that it just pours out of her with no technique or training or effort. She's been in town for three days, staying in some run-down old place. Lane was trying to hook up a place for her at a women's shelter for six months until those other spots came open. He couldn't believe I was backing out. He laughed and said God must have been looking out for Zoe Etheridge when he made me change my mind, but I told him it was me God was looking after. Oh my gosh. So that girl's moving in your spot? I nodded. Can you believe it? He called her when I was up there. She's working at a convenience store, and she gave Lane the name of the place in case he needed to reach her. I was there when he called her. She cried on the phone, which made me cry too. Oh my gosh, are you serious? I nodded, and I saw the painting she did when she met with Lane the other day. I added, 
What was the subject matter? It was a toy, I said, just a little toy that was sitting on the desk in Lane's office. It was obvious that she just looked at it and replicated it when he asked her to show him what she could do. She has this unusual style that gave the toy a personality. It was a painting of a little desk toy, and I seriously wanted to buy it from him. It was just amazing. She's one of those people who has a gift. You have a gift, Sarah said. I smiled. So do you, I said, since it was the truth. I can't believe it worked out that she got to take your spot, she said. And she wasn't even in the running for it. Someone from out of town just came in and swiped it right up. My timing couldn't have been more perfect for her, I said. Do you think she'll do the documentary? She asked. I just talked to the producers before I came here. They asked me about the girl who's taking my place, and I told them she was amazing. How do you feel about the whole thing? She asked. Amazing. I'm so thankful that my spot got filled in a cool way like that. It makes me feel so much better about backing out. I mean, I felt great about it anyway, but that's just the icing on the cake. Sarah reached out and wrapped her arm around my shoulders. What's the other thing? She asked. What other thing? You said you had two things to say about s and s Oh, yeah. Lane said he could use some help at the gallery. So I'll still get to sell my art there and everything. Oh, my gosh. He really hated to see you go, huh? I smiled. I'm the one who asked about the job. It was Joe's idea so that I could still be tied in with them. And Lane just said, sure, you're hired? Pretty much, I said with a shy grin. It might not be glamorous. He said something about helping with paperwork and phone calls. So? At least you're still connected with all those guys, she said. I know. Sarah turned to stare at me with a look of utter confusion. What? I asked. This is like the world's most perfect outcome, she said dazedly. I laughed. You have no idea how relieved I am to hear you say that. I honestly thought you would think I was insane for not doing that documentary. I think it worked out perfectly, she said. And if you hadn't quit, just imagine what would have happened to that girl. She might have given up and gone back to Texas. What girl might go to Texas? Josh asked. I looked around and didn't see him, but it was obvious by the muffled sound of his voice that he was under the bleachers spying on us. What are you doing under there? I asked, peering at him through the crack in the bench that was right above us. He giggled at being spotted, and we giggled at his giggling. Get up here, you little rascal, I said, wiggling my finger in the crack. Sarah and I watched as Josh appeared from the end of the bleachers and then crossed over to meet us wearing a huge, satisfied grin on his face because he had tricked us. I got y'all, he said, sitting down. You sure did, Sarah said. I thought we had a bleacher monster under there. What happened to that girl in Texas, he asked, still curious about what he overheard. She might have moved back to Texas if I hadn't quit, I said. What did you quit, he asked. My new apartment, I said. So you're just going to stay at your old one? I nodded. That'll be good, Josh said. I think sometimes it's better to stay at your old one anyway. With that, we all turned to watch the guys who were in full action on the court. Joe was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with one of the players on the other team, and I watched as the player tried to dribble around Joe for a layup, and Joe took the ball from him. Yes! I yelled really loudly. Josh broke out clapping in support of my exclamation, even though it probably wasn't the most notable play of the game. I didn't care. Joe smiled at me after his team made the basket, and his swoon-worthy expression aimed at me was well worth any humiliation associated with my outburst. I let out another whoop, clapping for the basket. Josh and Sarah clapped too, and I watched Joe's smile broaden as he shook his head at me. He gave me an almost imperceptible wink right before the guy on the other team threw the ball in, and he had to once again focus on the game. He winked up here. Did you see that? Josh asked, pushing at my leg excitedly. It might as well have been Derek Rose out there with how excited the boy was. I loved the fact that Josh looked up to Joe, and most of all, I loved that Joe was worthy of being looked up to. I loved him all the way around, and that's all there was to it. Epilogue 
eight months later. Joe and I got married in the spring. The ceremony was held in a beautiful old church in the city. There was a gorgeous banquet hall on the premises, so we held the reception right there in the same location. Joe's mom planned everything. She didn't get to do much in regards to planning with Eli or Sarah's wedding, so she went all out for ours. We had hundreds of guests, more than half of which I didn't even recognize. I found myself standing on the dance floor of the reception hall, staring at a huge group of people who were dancing and having the time of their lives, and all of them were there to celebrate with us. I smiled, reminding myself to take it all in. My family, Joe's family, and our friends all getting along in companionable wedding bliss. The whole thing felt so natural that I hadn't even told myself to wing it one time all evening. I was winging it without even trying. This officially makes you my sister, you know, Sarah said, coming up behind me and putting her arm around my shoulders. I already was your sister, I said. I know, but now it's a double. Now it's official. I turned to make eye contact with her, and we smiled at each other. Did you see Josh? she asked. I looked around, locating Josh who was sitting at one of the kids' tables. He brought a little friend with him, she said. I noticed that he was sitting with a boy about his age, and I nodded. It's Byron, she said. I shot her a questioning glance, and she smiled. He said they're friends now, she said. He's probably going to want to introduce you whenever you get the chance to go over there. I'll go over there now, I said. I'll find Joe and take him over there with me. Take who over there with you? Joe asked, grabbing me from behind so suddenly that I yelped as I stumbled back. He knew what he was doing, and I was in no danger of falling, anywhere except for into his arms. He positioned my back into his chest, using a hand around my waist and leaned in to kiss me on the cheek and neck several times. I had just danced with him a few minutes before, yet his presence still left me surprised and breathless. I loved his smell and the way his whiskers grew on his cheek. I reached up and ran my fingertips along it, feeling anticipation wash over me as he held me close to him with unrelenting pressure. He held on to me for dear life, and I held him back, making sure his arms stayed in place, since I never wanted him to let me go. I had been talking to Sarah, but she had given up on getting my attention again once Joe walked up, and was now dancing with Colin. Kiss me, Joe said, causing my blood to turn warm. I did, I said. When? When we said I do. He shifted me so that we were facing each other. That was forever ago, he said. I was struck by how much I loved him. I'm so happy, I whispered. He smiled. I love you. I'm happy and I love you, I said. And then he kissed me. He kissed me deeply. Not at all concerned with the chaos taking place around us, he held me close and kissed me like he meant it. Joe Spicer kissed me like he was my husband and I was his wife. He tried to break the kiss, but he just couldn't do it. As if he couldn't resist, he put about five more kisses right on my mouth before finally pulling back for good. We stood there and stared at each other when he finished, and the people standing around actually applauded. We should go talk to Josh and his friend, I said after taking a few seconds to get my breathing under control. That's fine. But when do I get to take you home? he asked. As soon as this is over? And then you're all mine after that, he said. I wrinkled my nose at him with a smile. I already was all yours. So there it is, folks. My happily ever after. Just the way it happened. It's a very different story than I would have dreamed up for myself, yet somehow infinitely better. I've come to realize a very important truth as a result of all this, and it's that God knows what he's doing when he gives you a thorn. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of Not Your Average Joe by Brooke St. James, read for you by Kate Rudd.